This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. Uh, welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting for May 6th. 2020, based on Governor Baker's executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, GL Chapter 30A, Section 20, and signed Thursday, March 12, 2020, this planning board meeting is being held virtually using the Zoom platform. My name is Christine Graham Mullen, and as chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 632. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken as normal. I will now take a roll call. Board members, as you hear your name called, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and then please place yourself back on hold. Uh, Michael Burtwistle? Here. Maria Chow? Here. Jack Jemsick? Here. David Levenstein? Socially distant. <laughs> Doug Marshall? He's still not here? Okay. Um, and Janet McGowan? Here. Okay. I, I saw Doug. Yeah, so I just wanted to confirm that. Pam, what do you see there? I can... I don't see everybody. Hold on. I'm spinning down. Uh, I do not see him at this point. So, um, if anyone notices him pop in, we'll re uh, reflect it in the minutes. Okay. Board members, if technical difficulties arise, you may need to pause temporarily to, uh, for the, uh, the problem to be rectified, and then we will continue the meeting. If you do have technical issues, please let um, IT, who tonight that's Sean or Pam, know. Discussion may be suspended while the technical issues are addressed, and the minutes will know if a disconnection uh, has occurred. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your raised hand and call upon you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. Opportunity for public comment will be provided during the general public comment period and at other appropriate times throughout the meeting. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during the uh, general public comment period. If you wish to make a comment during the public comment period, you must join the meeting via the Zoom teleconferencing link. This link is shown on the slide. Yep, it's up there. Um, and it can be entered into a search engine uh, by typing HTTPS some, uh, colon backslash backslash zoom dot US backslash J backslash nine seven two eight four zero five five nine zero three. This link can also be found on the- Christine, um, Christine, Yes. I just wanna let you know that Mr. Marshall has joined us. Oh, thank you. And thank you for uh, uh, putting that in the minutes. Welcome, Doug. Um, we're on the call to order here. Uh, the agenda is also located on the town website in two different places. One is through the calendar listing for this meeting, which is on the homepage, the town homepage, and find the link on the event called Event Details. A second way is to go to the planning board uh, webpage and click on the most recent agenda link. And on that agenda document, which I think is up right now, you will see that same um, link that you can click on. Please indicate you wish to make a public comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. Uh, if you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your telephone. Uh, when called on, please identify yourself using your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes and at the discretion of the planning board chair. If these guidelines are not co um, complied with or the speaker exceeds their allotted time, their partic participation will be disconnected from the meeting. Moving onward, the slide will now show the meeting agenda. Again, note the virtual meeting Zoom link. Uh, so at this time, we will move forward to item one, which is minutes, which I believe we don't have any finalized minutes. Is that true, either Pam or Chris? That is correct. Okay, thank you. 
We'll move to item two, which is the public comment period. I'm gonna click to attendees. Uh, hold on, I'm trying to see who's, whoa. <laughs> uh, hold on, um, whose hand, I saw a hand go up, but there, I don't seem to, Pam confirm, I don't see any hands up right now. There was um, Kay uh, Rosenthal, I just, uh, there we go. There was, I just unmuted that person. Okay, thank you. That's probably why I couldn't see that. Okay, great. So um, I see a Kay Rosenthal. Uh, if you could please identify yourself and your address and uh, welcome. And um, you, have, you, you have three minutes on public comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is Ken Rosenthal. I live at 53 Sunset Avenue in Amherst and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. I wanna to speak to the item that you have number 440R, not to the substance, but the process. And I know how important this item will be at a time of great change in our world, our country, and our town. We have been through great change before, and we have dealt with change in many ways. Now we're going to be talking about change in zoning, among other things. And what I'm hoping that this planning board will do, and I know it will have public hearings, but I'm hoping you'll do more than that. I'm hoping you'll have public forums to which you will be uh, inviting specifically and generally, not only the neighbors and residents and citizens of the town, but business people, their landlords and prospective developers, not just giving people opportunity, but specifically inviting them to come and speak, not to particular things that they want to do, but to the general developments that we expect to see in the town. These are, this is really an unprecedented time. We've been through very interesting times of change. In the 60s, we grew very rapidly, but we knew what direction that was going to be. We don't know about direction now. We don't know how the colleges and university are going to change. We don't know what the business community is going to be like. Nor do we know how people are going to behave, how they are going to spend their time at home, and I'm speaking of a time when we do not have a coronavirus to deal with. We still now will have that problem with us too. So here is my hope. My hope is that the way you will proceed is very deliberately, not um, in a hearing format in which you ask people to speak to you, but people to speak with each other in ways that give us a chance to have interchange and, and conversation about where we all think we may be going. I hope these will be multiple forums and I hope you will take your time to do it. And I thank you for listening to me this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I see one other hand. Uh, do you see that, Pam? I Hilda Greenbaum. Hilda Greenbaum. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, welcome, Hilda Greenbaum, uh, or whoever it is. Please identify it's Hilda. yourself. It's me. Hi. Hi. I just have a quick question, and that's to ask if you will be accepting questions or comments from the public after the uh, consultants have given their report tonight. Uh, I believe we will, Chris. Okay. Yeah. Yes, we will. Because it makes more sense to do it then than now. Thank you. Okay. Pam, I don't see other any other hands, is that correct? I see one more, Constantine. Oh, they, okay, great, You're, thank you. Whoops, it's flicking around here. Uh, I can, uh, so uh, Constantine, please identify yourself and your address. Yes, yes Constantine Plashikov. Okay. I'm sorry I joined the meeting a bit late. Uh, did you have a chance to talk about the pandemic? COVID-19, no? We don't have that on our agenda tonight. Well, uh, you know, but we're talking about the playground. Oh, the playground, uh, that will be on next after this. Oh. We'll be opening the public hearing. If you have a question about that, I suggest you wait till we finish with that and then we'll have a public okay. comment period. Thank you. Okay. Constantine, can you tell me your street address, please? It's 289 Triangle Street. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay. I don't see any other hands right now. 
So we will proceed to uh, item three, public hearing, site plan review. And I will open the public hearing. We did have this come to our last meeting, but that was sort of more of an informational um, presentation. At this time, we're actually um, going to open a public hearing for the Kendrick Park Playground. So, <clears throat> all right, so uh, six, it was for 635, it's actually 642. In accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted. This hearing is being held for the purpose of providing an opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2020. 07 Town of Amherst, East Pleasant Street, Kendrick Park Playground. Request to for our approval to construct a playground, walkway, seating areas, and other site improvements for a public park under section 3.335 of the zoning bylaw map 11C-244 RG Zoning District. Uh, the first thing I will ask, uh, are there any board disclosures or conflicts? Um, I don't see any hands. That's what I'm watching for. Click your hand if you do. I don't see any. Um, so we will move to item three, which is the applicant's presentation. I want to just ask Chris Bestra, is there any introduction or um, a statement you want to make before we or introduce the consultants? Um, this uh, presentation will be made by Nate Malloy, who's a senior planner in the planning department about the Kendrick Park Playground. We did oh, not okay. hire a consultant for this project um, because we have such a good um, DPW staff yeah. and they were able to uh, do to work with us on the design. So Nate, I believe is here and he can go ahead and give the presentation. Great. Welcome, Nate. And Nate has, um, I assume there's some slides that will be going up. And I believe, Pam, you have those or Nate will be um, handling his own. I think we have, we both have them. Nate, what would you, oh, wait I a can, minute. Um, I can share my screen. That's fine. I think that you should because I don't see them right here. Okay. Sure. It's, um, Everyone see that? This is hi. This is Nate, senior planner. This is um, you know, this is cover sheet one that was submitted with the application. The, the um, you know, uh, the town we presented this on the fifteenth of April. Uh, we went to the design review board on April twenty second as well and received comments. Then uh, we're planning to go back in May to the design review board, uh, and since our presentation on the fifteenth. There's been a number of comments submitted online uh, through the online comment form and just through email and uh, and, and um, notes to staff. So we we met as a team a few times, and I'll just say that the plan that's here has been changed. So um, you know the north part of the play area, um, and I'll get into that. But you know there's been a lot of comments and suggestions, and the design team has been taking them seriously in terms of you know, accessibility, integration of natural features, and, you know, trying to create really, um, you know, a nice walkable um, path system. So the, um, you know, I'll walk through what Paul Dethier, the town's, um, one of the town's engineers has prepared, and then I, I have uh, additional slides to show. You know, we did start off with um, an existing condition survey. So, we do have, um, you know, we had a consultant survey the entirety of Kendrick Park, including the topography. And so, you know, that was important for us just to know utilities, trees, um, curb edge and everything. So we have that for our guidance. And, you know, just quickly on this plan here, this is kind of the central area of Kendrick Park, the middle, and there's some topography here. The play area is north of that where it levels out. So this is the area envisioned in 2011 where the amphitheater would be and we're up above that um, in elevation. So, you know, we're sticking with the general area that was proposed in 2011 and, you know, we're trying to work with the trees and the existing topography. If we look at sheet three, it's, 
there is a lot to um, to see. Um, I guess the, the main thing is there's an existing driveway and hard pack here off East Pleasant Street on the east side where um, you know, there is some, um, you know, there's a curb cut and we're proposing to use, you know, have a walkway here, the main play area, and then, you know, work with the topography to have this east-west connection that slopes south. The, um, you know, within this, this play area, there will be, um, you know, some excavation. We're trying not to impact the tree's roots. So, you know, every surface needs a base material. And so, you know, we've been talking about what's the least amount of material we need to excavate or scrape off to, to have, to have, you know, either, a, um, you know, walkways or, you know, if the agility area is over here to have, you know, um, a wood fiber base. And then, you know, in the play area here with the rubberized surface, what does that mean? And so the design really responded to what would be the drip line of all the existing trees and try to position the, you know, the areas that would require the most excavation and earthwork to be outside of what's considered, you know, the, the no, you know, the do not work area within the tree uh, drip line. Nate, you know, can I interrupt you? Sure. Chris, Chris, Chris Brestrup had her hand raised, although now I see it's down. Oh no, it's back up. Sure, Chris, do you have a comment or would you? Christine recognizes me. I just wanted to make a Oh, Kevin, yes, you're recognized. So I just wanted to make an introductory statement about the origin of this. Um, we do have a design from, for, for those of you who did not attend the uh, April 15th meeting and don't really know much about this project, um, we yeah. did uh, an overall design of the project back in 2011. And recently, um, Nate applied for, the town applied for uh, a grant, a park grant, and we received $400,000 in the park grant um, to build a playground in Kendrick Park, which was part of the original plan. And then we went to the um, town council and received another $260,000 worth of uh, CPAC money. So I just wanted to you know, let people know that who hadn't been participating in previous discussions about this, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, Nate. Oh, no, that's fine. Yeah. So to, you know, to um, continue what Chris had said, you know, the park grant we've mentioned before wants to have the plans finalized by June 1 and um, bidding this summer with construction to start in the fall and a deadline of completion by June 1 next year. And as far as I understand, those deadlines have not been extended. The, um, you know, the town, we've met with a few vendors and you know, we're getting, um, we're trying to move things along, but it is actually a little slower, you know, having to work remotely. So we've asked the state about the deadline, about extending the deadline. So anyways, back to this. So really this, you know, this design here tries to respond to, you know, existing trees that the tree warden, Alan Snow and public works and staff thought were um, healthy enough and could withstand work around them and also topography. And, you know, it's, as you can see, it's not right on North Pleasant Street. So there is some topography you know, the site does have a little bit of a, a, a you know, a little bit of a hill here on, nor on the North Pleasant Street side. So we're, we're pulling it a little bit away, both because there's um, existing trees and things that need to be moved. And if, if ever North Pleasant Street gets rearranged in terms of parking or traffic flow, you know, this design would not be impacted. Uh, as we move north, I'm just indicating even though the design will have changed slightly up here, the limit of work is pretty similar. So again, this area opens up and there's not many existing trees. And so, um, you know, all the walkways would still need some excavation, but we're outside of the drip line of trees and we're you know, trying to create, you know, walkable paths. So this is the demolition and site preparation plan. Sheet four here, the, um, you know, layout and materials, <clears throat> the, uh, this general area, if you can follow my, my cursor, this east-west walkway, this play area, and this sitting area, none of this, had, you know, this all remains pretty much the same as we've seen it. There's an agility area over here to the, um, to the north, and then, you know, there's the amphitheater area, and again, accessible walkways. And so, you know, this has changed a little bit, but the idea is still to have a continuous loop of walkways and um, have them be accessible. So this this walkway of east west will be will be um, will be blacktop. Will be asphalt. It's meant to be um, 
paved in the winter, so that's why they want a hard material. It will have um, benches along it, and it'll have um, you know a number of lamp posts along it. So this will become something that's maintained year round. The rest of the walkways in um, you know the park itself will not be maintained in the winter, so they won't be plowed. And this whole big area right here in this play area, this is where there'll be manufactured equipment, and it'll be a rubberized surface. And you know that that's necessary for accessibility and for fall safe area. The sitting area over here will be surrounded by um, a stone wall, a granite wall, and it will be stamped. Um, gosh, I forget what we decided. If I think it's maybe stamped asphalt or permeable paving here with you know similar tables as shown. Um, the idea is that this will be you know a, a different texture material, but it will all be a you know an accessible surface. The the walkways up north of here, throughout the rest of the play area, we're looking at doing permeable paving, and then maybe as an alternate doing um, asphalt paving. So depending on price, we're going to seek both. But the idea would, you know, we really like the idea of having some permeable paving here. Um, you know, there's benches throughout the play area that will be, you know, a, a painted aluminum. There'll be gr a granite curb at least a six to eight inch granite curb on some areas around the pollinator garden and along this edge. We're looking at using boulders and other hardscape material too, both as things to play on and then also to form an edge and a barrier in certain areas. Um, you know, in the, the amphitheater area will be Goshen stone with granite and stone sitting that's in the hillside. Up, up in this area now, we're looking at having um, a circular area with keystone and maybe some granite boulders. It's not shown here, but in lieu of a sandbox, we're go going to have basically like a, a keystone area with rocks around it. The agility area shown here with some, some um, vertical logs will be, a the area will be extended, but that'll be an area that has, um, you know, logs that are um, on the ground and slightly raised. They'll be staked into the ground. There'll be vertical logs that'll then also be um, you know, in, in steps or in different patterns, there'll be different size rocks. And it'll all be um, in an area with wood fiber um, ground cover. So it's not wood chips, it's actually a, you know, a material that is, meets a safety standard. So, um, you know, this area will be considered the more of the natural play area that leads into this Goshen stone, you know, end up connecting through here. It'll still be the walkway, but it'll be backed up to here with, you know, the Goshen stone amphitheater and stone steps um, and you know, a number of benches throughout. So we're really looking at an integration of material, both you know, surface material and then um, you know, vertical elements, whether it's natural rock, uh, cut granite and logs. I'm not sure if there's any questions at this point or I'll keep going. So sheet five, grading and drainage. The, um, the idea here is again. I'll start with this east-west walkway. You know, it's this is all of this is considered a, a walkway. It's not um, it's not a ramp. Uh, so you know, there's no railings necessary in this area right here. This is the the central drainage area. So there'll be under drains under the play area and under this area that come to a. Um, I'm not sure if it'll, if it'll be a catch basin, but just a um, a depression. Um, you know, and then it, it connects into the into the uh, town's drainage system. But this is also gonna be, this will be an overflow. And the thought here is this is a drainage swale that will be planted. So it's, we're trying to have it be a slight rain garden. So, um, you know, most of the material is, it's, it's all gonna be sheet flow off of this. It's just only one and a half percent up to a 2% frost slope on the playground. And it's all sheet flow that'll, you know, go off the, the paved areas and go into the mulch beds on the sides or It'll come through the under drains into this area and then, um, you know, go through this swale here to the overflow structure here. So, you know, this is intended to be an accessible walkway. All this has, you know, would meet ADA standards for cross slope and, you know, longitudinal slope. The, um, you know, so we're really here, if you follow this, I'll just show an example of these contour lines show, you know, there's, there is some grading up to create this sway on the side, but we're really trying to minimize how much we're deviating from the existing topography as much as we can along the walkways. 
um, you know, we'll feather it out the existing, but we're not trying to bring up the grade much. The, the big difference here is that this hill is no longer part of the plan. It was brought up a few times with the planning board men, um, asked about it. And then one of the vendors asked about the utility and accessibility of, of uh, the slope walkway and the hillside. And so this essentially will still be here, but it'll be a, a, at grade. So all these existing topography lines you see um, won't be here. The walkway will still be um, above grade a bit, but not, you know, not three or four feet. So we're thinking, you know, two feet at most above the existing grade. So there'll be less fill. Um, but this, you know, this is still, you know, if you just take off these two outside contour lines, you know, the rest of this is still the way it would look essentially. So we're, you know, we're going to be raising everything up a bit in the play area. Um, for one, you know, one reason is to, you know, we have this sub base material we need to put in. So um, we're excavating a little bit and then we're filling a little bit. So we're trying to balance the cut and fill. Um, so everything will be, and to get the right slopes for drainage. So everything is going to be raised up a little bit, um, um, but not, not too high. Um, you know, most some of these walkways will eventually be, will essentially end up being at grade. So on this edge, there will there won't be a curb. You know, there'll be a, a planting bed and mulch on this side. So, you know, the grade will just meet up with these exterior walkways on the east side. On the west side, there'll be a curb uh, with plantings behind it. But this curb really is also helping to, um, you know, retain some earth. You know, it is actually helping to create an edge against what is, you know, sloped, a sloped. Uh, backdrop against the walkway. Are there any questions about the grading or the? Uh, Nate, I see that Chris Bestrup has her hand up. She must have something she wants to add. Hey, Chris. I apologize. I didn't mean to have my hand raised. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, Nate, if you're at a, a stopping point, our no, next... We have a few more sheets. I was just going to go through them. And then I have, okay. a, I, have a, I have a presentation with some precedent images just to help, I think, clarify and a few things. Doug you, Marshall um... has his hand raised. OK. Um, OK. So I uh, recognize Doug. Yeah, I have two questions. Um, one is whether there's any expectation that at some point in the future there would be a sidewalk along the east side of North Pleasant Street and if that happens whether it would require any rework of any part of this design and the second question is uh, you talked about a fair amount of permeable pavers uh, and I wondered whether that is driven by uh, some sort of uh, stormwater consideration or what the reason for the more expensive paving material is rather than some sort of imper or impermeable paving. Thank sure. you. The, um, the, you know, we pulled the, this design away from North Pleasant Street um, with the assumption that if there was a sidewalk, you know, this wouldn't have, this would not be, um, would not need to be moved or disturbed. So, you know, the 2011 plans did show the curb edge coming east a little bit for nose and parking. There's, there's been different ideas of what's happening along this edge of North Pleasant Street, but the design and even this walkway to the south here is pulled in a little bit. So if there is any need to bring the curb in, uh, the, this design won't be impacted. In terms of the permeable pavers, I guess I can be a little more clear. We're actually looking at doing like a um, for the, the, the north walkways, I'll call them, if it's permeable paving, it's not actually pavers, it's, it's a, a poured in place um, permeable pave, pavement. So it actually would come, you know, there's different types, um, they actually come in bags and it's, it's an aggregate that you form uh, and you put you, you know, they pour it in place and it's just the way the aggregate works, it creates gaps to let water in. So it's not as if this would be, these walkways would be, um, you know, brick on a on a base and loose pavers, it would actually be a, a continuous surface that would be permeable. So whether it's permeable asphalt or permeable, we're looking at, you know, some other materials, it would be a, um, that in the way we've 
the way we're thinking about structuring the, the, the bid would be that there'd be an alternate for it so that if it, if it is a lot more costly, we could decide not to do it. But we'd still, you know, we've been told that the price per, whether it's a, you know, linear yard or linear foot is not much more than um, paving it with, with asphalt, with blacktop. And I think it would actually be less expensive than concrete. So we're, you know, we're doing it both for, you know, um, could be for cost, but it's also really to keep the rainwater on site and something just to, you know, less having a less, you know, a less asphalt um, in the park. Thank if we're, um, this, yep, go ahead, Nate. Sure, this is the lighting plan and conduit plan. What, you know, so right now at Kendrick Park, you know, there's utility boxes on the perimeter. Uh, there's no lighting or, you know, conduit on the interior. For, um, for electrical and there's no water in Kendrick Park either. So there's no, um, you know, we're not proposing right now to bring in water. We discussed whether or not we'd maybe get a hydrant, but this, that may not, that's not part of this project right now. What is part of the project though, is running conduit along the walkway and actually having, you know, pole lights along this, this main walkway and then running conduit up through the play area um, and have it end at a, um, you know, at a um, at an at grade box, so it'd be a subsurface box. The top would be at grade, and we just stub out a number of conduit points for um, possible future lighting. So that lighting isn't proposed at this time, but you know, while the the area is um, being excavated and prepared for construction, we would just run conduit to likely spots if we wanted to have you know lighting come up one side of the the play area and even for other lighting opposite the play area. So. Um, you know, the only thing that would be happening is, you know, five light poles along the east-west walkway, and they would be the um, acorn lights that are downtown now. Um, you know, they'd be on a concrete base, and they're the, the black um, wrought iron. And, you know, they would, I'll say they're temporary, but the idea would be that they, you know, would illuminate the path, and if, when, when there's um, a decision about future lighting for Kendrick Park and even this area of downtown, if there's new pedestrian style lighting, uh, we would swap out the light poles. So the light poles are something that the town's going to provide um, and be able to you know, get this path illuminated. That's, that's the lighting. Um, now these are just details, um, you know, I. You know, their standard construction details just but just to show that you know everything has a sub base and material so you know we're looking at you know you know there's a depth to everything so um you know the wood fiber in the agility area is at a minimum of eight inches of wood fiber with the can be on a sub base or on a heart you know on a on the existing material so i mean there's anywhere from eight inches to a foot of material even in the natural area and you know with the walkways too again there's you know, um, anywhere from a foot to 15 inches of material that would go um, beneath the surface of the walkway. So, um, you know, that's something that we've been considering. Uh, more details. Um, I think what I'll show now is just some some images of what what we're considering for um, for site furnishings and different precedent images. So. Um, you know, do more is we've, the town uses this, uh, this vendor for different furnishings. So these are, these are actually the benches at Groff. We would probably not use the, it's not, they're not black, but we like this style. So it's all aluminum as opposed to recycled plastic. The idea would be the benches would be on tubes as opposed to a big concrete slab. Um, and there's different styles of benches, some with backs and without backs. So you could sit different ways and face different areas of the park. Um, but these are the styles of benches we're looking at. For the, for the tables in the circular sitting area, it would be something very similar to this. Uh, and then for an accessible um, table, you know, there'd be one without a fourth chair. So this is a one, a one piece table and chair set that could, you know, can be bolted or can be left um, um, within the site and not, you know, it's, it's quite heavy. Uh, the trash cans would match what is in downtown, and they could be both half, uh, you know, half recycling and half um, trash, or it can be one or the other. Um, I think that's hasn't been decided. 
in terms of stones, we're looking at, you know, both, you know, um, kind of not want to say rough or natural stone, and then, you know, a more finished stone in some areas. So it'll be, it'll be a mix of different stone materials. You know, here's pea stone. So if there's some, there's some areas with pea stone. So this just shows, you know, what, what we're considering in terms of the different stone material and even, you know, how it would be placed. If it was placed on an asphalt walkway. You know, we were considering having a number of these blocks around and something that could be used for play or for sitting. Uh, you know, here's a typical wall that we'd have perhaps around the amphitheater and other parts of the park. The um, one thing that has changed in the north part of the park, instead of, we're still thinking about having grass mounds, but not as high as what the, you know, we had originally proposed at five and a half feet with a slide. The slide actually wasn't as big as we would want. Um, so we're still considering having grass mounds. And so here's some images showing what that would look like in a play area. This is synthetic turf, which we're not proposing in Washington Square Park. These are, um, these are other images from another, um, from a learning, learning park. But just to give a sense for what we've been considering in terms of how, how it would work in Kendrick Park, uh, again, with natural stone. These following images are from Pulaski Park. And so, you know, they just took, um, the city actually provided the timbers here. It was white oak and black locust, and they were, um, you know, anchored into the ground um, with two, you know, with, with rebar or threaded rod that went two feet deep. But these, you know, this is a, a synthetic wood, wood mulch material, wood fiber material, and these logs are then, um, you know, through fastened all the way through the ground through these connection points um, to keep stable. Here's an image of it here. And again, here are these vertical logs. So we, we're considering doing something very similar in our agility area with vertical logs. And so these logs are um, equal depth buried to exposed. So if it's a two foot log, a foot is exposed and a foot is buried and there's no, you know, it's not set in concrete or anything. It's just um, into, you know, almost augered into the ground. And so we were, you know, we're considering something similar to that. For the play area, we are still, you know, considering doing, um, using manufactured equipment. And so this is an image that we showed before and it, um, you know, staff is gonna talk to the vendor about, um, you know, refining this a little bit, but, you know, in terms of what we like, this is an accessible spinner. So more than one person can um, get on it. It's at grade and it, it spins. Um, so we're gonna keep that. We do like the idea of having climbing structures and slides and different elevations of play. So this would be for older uh, five to 12 year olds. And this is two to five year olds with other, you know, individual play equipment um, in the playground. So we're looking at having, you know, three or four bigger structures and then small, a few other elements, but, it, you know, it's really targeted from to the two to five and five to 12 year old. And the following images are just showing different views of that, um, that same design. So there's, you know, different climbers, you could have some music makers and number of slides. Um, you know, and we're also looking at a few different types of roof structures. So I don't think we're going to um, have necessarily a, um, you know, a canvas or a, a seasonal shade structure that we have on, you know, at some playgrounds. We, we're trying them at Groth. They're actually might be pretty difficult to manipulate, get on and off, but the vendors do offer different types of perforated material, uh, sometimes as a canopy above these. Um, the play area is in an area that does get a lot of sun. And so we've been considering having you know, whether it's a metal, um, some areas of metal perforated roof just to provide, you know, some type of shade um, midday in the summer. And that's, that's, um, I'm going to have a show one more thing. Um, so that's, those are all the technical documents. The other piece I've mentioned is, um, you know, here's the 2011 schematic and we're still staying within this general area. Uh, what's changed really is um, the plan we were looking at was something similar to this, where there was a slide and a walkway, and there had been, you know, a, a sandbox. What the new design that we're really leaning toward is something along these, these lines. So instead of having the hill up here, these walkways are mostly at grade, as I mentioned, a little elevated, but within this area are grass mounds, similar to what we saw in the picture. So these would be, you know, raised grass mounds with you know, an accessible walkway all around. This over here in the gray is the P-stone area. 
and then this is the amphitheater area. The agility area would get extended and have more options, maybe even possibly a sandbox here, but the idea would be to extend the agility area to connect into the, the amphitheater area. Um, you know, that's something that came to light with all the comments um, and also talking with the vendors about, you know, the, the cost and the utility of the, what was considered the hillside slide. It actually wasn't, you know, the slide was only going to be four feet, maybe six feet at most, and it would be above grade and you need to have it on post with synthetic surface underneath as a fall safe zone. So, you know, if you see pictures online and you envision, I'm not sure why, but you can go online and see some really cool hillside slides built into the hillside. And that's not what the vendors were offering. And, um, you know, if the play equipment has a number of slides, they're going to be taller and better than what we could have had here. So that was a $20,000 item that maybe was not worth the, um, both the grading and, you know, the cost of equipment. So, you know, we still want to have some grass mounds here and have different types of play here. Um, you know, uh, planting beds, benches, and seating around. Uh, there'll be a, a seating nook here. Keeping this at grade also allows for possible um, connections when the park gets expanded. So, you know, you could have a, a path come off the north or even through here and connect again. So the, the ability of making future pedestrian connections is easier on this plan because there's, there's not as much um, topographic change. I think I, I'll stop there. Thank you, Nate. That was great. Uh, at this point, we're going to move to the site visit report that happened uh, this week. Um, and then I'll uh, move on to questions from the board. Uh, I believe Michael volunteered. It's, um, yesterday, um, five of us were at the, um, at the site. Uh, observing uh, the, uh, what were the changes in plans as well as the, uh, old, the older uh, structures plans that we had seen. Uh, particularly noticed the, uh, the, the two major trees that need to be uh, removed, uh, both uh, large and both uh, uh, aged, um, whether or not they're uh, viable without, uh, uh, without the playground being built or not, I, I don't know. But uh, in, in any event, it was clear that uh, there would be plenty of uh, tree cover remaining, even with the two trees that would be removed. Uh, we also located the site uh, relative to the uh, cross streets, McClellan, and to the uh, buildings uh, across East Pleasant. Um, and um, that was about it. Thank you. Um, at this time, I will move to uh, questions from the board. So um, I'll be watching for your hands and I'll try to call you in order. Um, okay, so I recognize Doug and then Michael will be next. Yeah, I wondered what the life expectancy of the elements of the park are and what impact this would have on the annual operating budget of the town, whether there's a lot of maintenance uh, expenses that'll be part of an annual outlay. Thank you. Okay, Nate, do you want to answer that? No, no. Um, okay, do you yeah, want to? I will. The, um, you know, we've, when, um, I'll start with the last one with the annual maintenance costs. It's something that you know, we've staff has spoken with um, you know, the different departments, planning, leisure services, and public works. Right now, the you know the annual budget for maintenance is not a lot, and so when we have upgraded, um, you know, Mill, Mill River Fields, and now that we're doing Groff, you know, we've always said that we need to increase our operating and maintenance budget. So you know, we had um, um, a, a, a sod company come in and work with Amherst Baseball on the Little League fields. And, you know, when we told him the, the operating budget for maintaining the grass, he almost didn't want to put new grass in because he's like, how are you going to maintain it when, you know, you have such a, a small budget. So I, I do think that there, you know, there will be some extra costs. I mean, the, the town maintains Kendrick Park now. So, you know, it, it mows it and maintains it now. Um, you know, the, in terms of maintenance, there won't be, as, you know, there'll still be maintenance here. Um, it'll just be a little different. So I'm not, you know, I don't think we've done a, 
calculated a specific amount of new maintenance, but you know, there will be less mowing, but maybe there'll be more raking in terms of mulch beds or other things. So um, there'll be an increased cost. Um, the life expectancy of materials, you know, the play equipment, gosh, even the rubberized surface, they say 20 to 25 years, you know, you just, you, you know, I mean, um, there is some maintenance on those as well. You know, the rocks and other surfaces, I mean, they're, you know, again, you know, everyone says 20 plus years. So we're, you know, we're anticipating at least for the, for the foreseeable future, if this were built, you know, not a lot of um, capital costs or maintenance on the materials, you know, you know, after 25 years, that could be reevaluated in terms of what, you know, what needs to happen. So sometimes the rubberized surface, the surface is good, but the cushioning underneath needs to be um, um, improved. So you can actually inject underneath the rubberized surface to keep, get the, you know, the fall safe protection again. Um, if we do use permeable paving, that needs to be cleaned annually or, or at some point, you know, it needs to be cleaned. Um, but we're, you know, so all the natural materials, the stone walls, the sitting, the rock walls and benches, I mean, we're anticipating that to need minimal maintenance in the long term. Uh, thank you. I'm going to recognize Chris Bestrup before Michael, she might have something to add. Thank you, um, Christine. I wanted to uh, note that two of the members of our design team um, work for the Department of Public Works. Um, Paul Dethier is an engineer and landscape architect who works for the DPW. And um, Alan Snow is the tree warden. And Alan is in charge of um, a lot of the maintenance of parks, including uh, maintenance of plant material and grass and all of that. So, so they were part of this discussion from the very beginning. and in fact, you know, helped us to choose materials with an eye towards um, lower maintenance. And that's one of the reasons why we've chosen to go in the direction of um, a manufactured play equipment for the larger play area. Uh, in addition to accessibility and um, safety factors, we also find that that type of material is um, requires less maintenance than some of the um, materials that are actually natural materials, which can deteriorate more rapidly over time. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Chris. Um, at this time, I'll recognize Michael, and then uh, next will be Janet. Yeah, uh, just a brief question about the uh, the mounds in the uh, north part of the of the area. Um, I love I love the idea of uh, grass mounds. Uh, are they going to be kept at the same uh, mowing height as the rest of the grass in the area, or will they be uh, shaggier. Nate. <laughs> yeah, I, my thought is they would be kept um, maybe not as short as um, the surrounding area, but I, I, I hadn't envisioned them becoming shaggy. Um, you know, maybe, um, you know, three, three inches or four inches, depending, you know, it depends on how much use they get too. You know, the idea here would be that um, we're considering putting sod down and actually have it be a, a really pretty thick, you know, kind of, um, material, you know, a sod material that can withstand heavy traffic, but then it would, it would be uh, maintained. Um, I can't, you know, I can't answer exactly how, how that was envisioned. I was thinking that would be, you know, maybe kept a little longer than some of the other surrounding grass, but not shaggy. That's some, a good question though. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I recognize Janet. Um, thank you for this presentation. I have questions about the maintenance. Um, I, I, I'm, you know, how often do the wood chips have to be kind of adjusted or cleaned? Um, like who will be maintaining the garden, weeding it, and what's the source of water to plant it, to um, water it? And then the planting beds, um, you know, the mounds look like they'd have to be hand mowed um, and the eating areas and the playground itself be cleaned pretty regularly. And so I just wondered like, is that gonna be a daily thing, a weekly thing? Um, it does seem to take up, you know, it's, it looks like a really interesting and fun playground, but it seems like if, if it has a lot of use, it's gonna need cleaning and watering and clipping and weeding and all those kind of tedious things of life. Yeah, I think the, uh, that's a good question. The, um, you know, as it is now with, um, with Alan and his crew and other public works, they, you know, they open all the parks daily and they do a sweep of the parks in terms of picking up trash. Um, you know, so there's a daily, there's a daily um, you know, opening and cleaning in terms of the more in depth, say weeding or things, I mean, I. You know, my thought is that 
uh, at least you know weekly, we'd want to have the wood chips um, in the in, a, in the agility area raked and um, you know make sure that they're being maintained. Um, we've discussed how the pollinator garden and other areas would be watered and maintained. So you know there's the the garden club in town, but you know we've also looked at whether you know right now Public Works is um, between Alan and Paul, they are looking at different plant varieties that you know are hardier and don't need as much um, as much maintenance. So I think that is a good point, um, you know, and we're still looking at some of the exact um, the exact details of that. So for instance, on the Western side of the park right here, I mean, we're showing plants here, but we're thinking, you know, uh, you know, uh, ground covers and shrubs and things that can be planted that, you know, necessarily once they're established, they don't really need uh, much maintenance. You know, they might need an annual pruning and maybe, you know, uh, weeding once or twice um, a season, but you know, they won't need any weekly maintenance. I agree that some of the flowering areas um, may need a little bit more, and that's something we we have discussed, and we haven't, um, you know, we've thrown out um, different ideas in terms of how that would work. But you know, right now, it's trying to look at different perennials or plants that are hardier that could withstand, you know, even droughts or you know different changes in temperature. Is there a water source for the plants, the gardens? So you know, the discussion was to um, when this is. Uh, constructed to have, you know, we were discussing whether or not we could, um, you know, run a hose from a um, from a fire hydrant, or get a watering truck that would come by um, mm -hmm. a few times a week. So um, long term, you know, the discussion was how how to bring water to the site, and you know, it's on the street, so that you know, one thought was to, um, you know, we haven't figured that out yet, actually. Um, you know, is to have a hydrant, but then how to hook up to that with a temporary meter, possibly. Um, the other question I had was about safety. And so in my experience, when you have small children and medium sized and large children, they move and kick balls. And so my concern is that kids will be kicking balls into the street and chasing after them. And so is there any thought to how that could be blocked, like the ball and, and the kid? Well, the... the um... You know, so right, you know, along North Pleasant, there is this natural barrier. So, you know, there's going to be a curb along this whole edge with plantings and rocks. You know, in this area, there's, um, again, some planting beds, and then there'll be the agility area. The, um, you know, just the other weekend, um, last weekend, Kendrick Park was packed with families and kids running around. And right now, there are no barriers, and there hasn't been necessarily a perceived safety issue. Um, you know, the thought is, you know, uh, along North Pleasant, there is a, this natural barrier. And on this edge, you know, we've talked about increasing the number of benches. So doubling up the benches, having more seating that can act as a barrier and have more eyes on kids. But, you know, at this time, we're not proposing a fence, whether it's here or along East Pleasant Street. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's pretty quiet park. I mean, you know, and, and fortunately for the packed park last weekend, there's hardly any traffic. But Usually there's a fair amount of traffic moving through there at different, you know, at rush hour times of day. And it's been a very quiet, lovely, passive park. And we're trying to get kids to come and play and families be there. So I just want to highlight that as a, a, a concern. Okay, yeah. Okay, at this time, I want to recognize Jack. Oh, oh sorry, Janet, quickly, would you have more concerns about, or about, about North Pleasant and East Pleasant, or is there one um, that would be a higher priority. Well, I, I think there's more traffic on East Pleasant, but you know, any, anytime you think of someone, some small kid chasing a ball where there are parked cars into a street, I think you have to worry. Mm -hmm. So North Pleasant would, I mean, I would just worry, but I, you know, obviously East Pleasant has more traffic, you know, North Pleasant has less. Um, I cut through that street a lot to avoid the traffic circle and things like that. I don't know. But I think, you know, you're, you're trying to draw people in to use the park and mm -hmm. traffic is always increasing. So, mm -hmm. I don't know, I just, I, you know, somebody who wrote in had suggested plantings, a, a thorny hedge, which sounded possibly cruel, but effective. And so I just wondered if there's an idea of that, like where balls can go and where kids can go. So, but it sounds like you are thinking of that too, though. Yeah, we, yeah, I don't think, I mean, like I said, on this side, we're really thinking this will develop into a really a vegetative hedge. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm without thorns, but you know, the thorns could, uh, that would definitely be a deterrent. Thorns pop balls. <laughs> that would end the ball. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, and I just want to, uh, on the fence part, I think Nate brought up a good point about how there are no fences now and people come and play ball and Frisbee and such. And we're only focused on one part of the park. Um, again, if Nate or whoever's, in, if you put that 2011 or the existing site uh, plan up, yeah. You know, it shows you that we're just talking about one little area. I mean, there's still a lot of open space that kids could be playing with. So it's sort of hard sometimes, I think, to draw a line. You know, we'd have to think about where that fence, you know, goes. Because um, it's this, it, there's still kind of a bit of an open field um, to the north part, right? You know, a past the... There is. A, there'll be this, you know, this area will remain open and, you know, this whole area will remain as it is in its current condition. So there are some big areas. I think it's interesting. I mean, um, you know, we had talked about even for the North Common having not, you know, like small fences like you'd see in New York City in certain parks, both to keep people on the walkway and then also to try to, you know, direct traffic, but maybe for safety. And um, in terms of fencing, you know, I, I Christine, I, I think, yeah, if it, once, if this starts becoming implemented, you know, a consideration for how the whole park can work, with different types of barriers would be really important. So could there be a, you know, if you did need a fence here, you know, is there a way then to carry it through the whole design of the park? Uh, yeah, like those really expensive, gorgeous wrought iron ones they used to put up like a hundred years ago. That would be beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm gonna recognize Jack again. He's been very patient. Oh yeah, and I actually, my question was on fencing as well. Um, uh, you know, I think I think the park. I I wasn't there at the site visit, but um, it looks extremely interesting and fun uh, for families and things like that. More of like a boutique kind of park, but I just noticed the the narrowness of Kendrick Park between North Pleasant and East Pleasant, and so I mean, I just know how. Well, I've had you know kids as well, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm not putting a ball into my argument, <laughs> but I knew I know kids is they they just run off, you know, from their parents, especially if there's you know the family has more than one kid, and then that kid kind of just goes, and this is going to be a magnet for families with you know lots of kids. So I also bring up the fencing uh, issue because I'm really concerned about the safety uh, on East Pleasant Street, um, and I I feel like it it you know all this all this stuff is going to energize kids and what we see now and what people are doing now in Kendry Park doesn't apply to how, you know, people are going to be enjoying, you know, this new park at all. It's going to be a different population. So um, that was my comment on, on the, I, I, I feel like there should be some fencing. It sounds like that could be accommodated, you know, later on um, as a fix, I guess. So, and then, and then uh, I have a second question and it's a little bit uh, odd, but I'm, I'm wondering about, you know, the, this country park used to have all these homes there and I know water and sewer, they were provided with water and sewer. So I know all that is uh, readily made by, and I also know that probably a restroom is very controversial, um, maintenance issues and all that. But I was wondering if uh, Nate or, uh, Chris could speak to what do we have for public restrooms right now? It just uh, it just seems like, um, and, and it doesn't even apply to this, I guess, necessarily. But um, for me, it seems like you know, that that's something that's lacking. Um, and I don't, I'm just, I'm wonder what others think uh, about that. Yeah. In the um, you know restrooms aren't part of this project. Um, it has been mentioned a, a number of times, you know, in terms of public restrooms, there's the Bang Center, which I think may be the closest in terms of a public facility. You know, uh, there's the Jones Library, um, Town Hall and the police station. The, um, I'm not sure how open the uh, fi Central Fire Station is, uh, but those are the public buildings. Um, you know, there has been some discussions about what you know, could a private restroom or facility building, um, would they open up to the public? Um, and that's something that, you know, um, can be researched a little bit more, but, um, you know, right now there are no restrooms planned for this, for this facility. I mean, you know, there's also community field up Triangle Street, uh, too, that's open. Um, yeah. 
but yeah, there are there are none uh, right now planned. You know, um, Nate, again, can you give us an idea of how much it costs? Like, you know, because I assume that's why you're not considering it right now. Uh, how much would it cost to put a standard, you know, bathroom building um, in this area? Yeah, it's interesting. The, um, you know, I guess it's like, you know, for some conservation areas and recreation areas, we've looked at getting um, prefabricated or like modular restrooms. So they'd be, you know, uh, um, maybe have two, um, two uh, accessible unisex bathrooms and it comes in a building, a modular mm -hmm. setup that you connect, um, you know, you, depending on how you want to do it, whether it's to a, a town water and sewer or if it's to, um, you know, whether it's compostable or not, the, um, but, you know, even that, you know, the prices are 150,000 for material. And then you're talking about installation and utility connections. And so, you know, I would think that having putting, and then if you want, you know, if you want to be, um, you know, decorative or have a certain aesthetic or, you know, what we did at community field, we renovated community field restrooms a few years ago, actually, and we had everything be automated. So all the lights are censored, water is censored, Toilets are censored, and you know it's a center block building. And I think that renovation was um, like 150,000. Wow. Um, it was quite a bit, and I was shocked at how much it cost. But you know, to get some you know sturdy fixtures and to really uh, you know improve the building. So I you know I think the cost would be 200,000, 300,000 for restrooms. Um, and then there's the like maintenance half the issue. Budget. <laughs> It's outside the budget. I mean, I, you know, I, I could be wrong. I mean, there could be other, you know, solutions, but, yeah. um, you know, as a public construction project, um, and then, you know, how, you know, where is it in the park? How big is it? You know, is it seasonal? Is it, is there a water heater? So sometimes if you have, you need hot water for the sinks. So, you know, there's a number of considerations. So it's usually not just, just the restroom, you know, you usually have to bring electricity in, you need a utility closet, um, can that so would that be like another grant or something you know a phase two of this park or because you're talking about maybe lights maybe water maybe the you know so yeah. you have yeah, I think like that's 100 right now or 660 you're trying to best utilize that kind of money and then they'd be like a phase two I can't speak to if, if restrooms would be a later phase I think you know, staff has heard it, and so it'd be a discussion in terms of how how would it fit into the park, you know, into the overall budget and in the location there. Um, you know, in terms of the the lighting, you know, my thought is the lighting we we're saying would be just right now is to run. You know, if we're looking at this plan here, we're going to have lights along this walkway, and then we're running conduit up. So if we ever have this connection, the lighting could just run up this way. You know, it's not the same plan, but you know, we'd have these interior um, lighting. You know, in terms of water too, we're thinking about having water somewhere here for the playground. But um, you know, a restroom is a much bigger discussion in terms of its overall aesthetic and location in the park. Okay. I'm going to recognize Chris Bestrup. I think she has something to add. I was just going to say that the um, the bid and the chamber have been having conversations with the town about the issue of public restrooms. So it is really a larger topic and. Um, you know, we, we are serious about addressing it, but um, this project, you know, can't accommodate it. But, um, you know, we hear you that um, there should be some sort of public restroom up in this vicinity of the downtown and whether it ends up in Kendrick Park or someplace else, um, you know, will have to be considered. But, um, you know, with, within our budget and our scope of work, it's re not really something that we can accommodate a, as part of this project. Um, I actually have a question, um, Nate, if you could, or whoever's driving, could put up one that shows the circular seating area with the tables. So here's this area right here. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, so my concern right now is um, the, the furniture that's been picked is, um, we have a picture of it in our packet. It's the, well, usually four seats attached, but to make it for handicraft, um, ADA, you can remove one of the seats. Um, so that's actually only three seats and three seats. Um, you know, so if a family of five, you can get kids to try to scooch and share on a thing. But I just wanted to ask the question, I automatically thought about what I had done with my family of five. And sometimes the attached picnic table with benches are nice. But then I realized that that area we're talking about, if it's 
um, the scale I believe is one inch to uh, uh, 10 feet. That area is really small. It's really only about eight by maybe max 12 feet and and even at that in a circle. Could that area, was there any thought about making it a little bigger, maybe fitting a third table? You know, it's very small because then I look, there's no other tables, there's lots of benches, but that's really the only seating area. Yeah, I think that's a good point. The idea is that this, you know, this would act as a seating wall around it. So, you know, although it's not a table, you'd have some more seating. And at the most recent meeting, we've discussed, you know, eliminating this kind of flower bed area so that, that you know, would just be, um, this whole area would just be a one, a paved surface without this, this flower area. Um, so maybe with, you know, eliminating this, you could get three tables in there. Um, you know, we can take your comments back to the team and, you know, see if this could be made just a little bit bigger to accommodate an extra table or two. Um, yeah, it was just, you got the play equipment right there. And, you know, very often mothers, you know, have maybe three kids or it's two moms and a combo of four or five. I knew I was in that a lot. And, you know, it's snack time or lunchtime. You're making it a multi-hour event to go down there. And um, I just, so adding to that, the strollers, it's, maybe it's good if you move that flower bed, but it's a real pinch point and you get three or four strollers in there with, if you were to try to stick a third table, it just seems, for all the land that's there, it just seems very pinched. So I would appreciate if people could go back and rethink that a little. All right. Uh, I'm gonna recognize Maria. Um, let's see, what was it? I think uh, overall, all the activities, you know, are similar to what we saw in the past and it looks great. Um, I think the only sheet that shows it in its context pretty well is the cover sheet, unfortunately. And so I'm hoping it's placed accurately, but it shows sort of the design in blue relative to East and North Pleasant Streets. And- um, Pop that one up. Yep. Is that- It's, let's see, it was in the set that was in our packet, which is I know outdated, but at least the sidewalk is sort of relevant to, um, the spoke, I think, bar or yeah, it was right like here across the street. Um, so I'm just wondering if any more consideration about you know uh, how it connects to the rest of the town. I know that you know in the future, East Pleasant Street side might change, but um, as far as that sidewalk on the west and where it hits McClellan and I guess that little perpendicular bit being sort of oh sorry, it's not pulled up yet. It's probably if we have the first page, Nate, from our handout, the like it was the cover sheet. Yeah, it's the, the only one where it really shows it. Sort it's of the buildings across the street, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's not this one. No. I have it handy. Pam, would you have that available? I think we quickly? had it up. You did, Nate. It was the very first sheet you had up. Isn't it this right here? Can see? Can everyone see what I'm sharing now? No. Oh, no. sorry. You know what? <laughs> sorry. New share. Sorry. I had yeah. it on my screen and um, yeah, there you go. go. Oh. Yeah. All right, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I was looking at it. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you got to really share, Nate. Yeah, not good at sharing. So yeah, it, it looks like the east side hits um, East Pleasant in a place that's sort of no man's land right now. But that's all right because you know something might change on the east. Um, I think the only bus stop is in front of the People's Bank, right? That that's further. Is it down, is it down here? And so um, I was just curious, like why on the west you have such a long sidewalk proposed and then I guess that's like a little crosswalk that you have that's um, headed toward the words where you have McClellan, McClellan Street. Mm -hmm. um, is that mm -hmm. just so like when people come from downtown, they cross over versus on the east side or, you know, like, yeah, just sort of contextually, what was the idea behind all that? pedestrian way on the west and then right i think the um you know so there's a new sidewalk here along east pleasant street so there's mm -hmm. you know one or two crosswalks here further south that isn't oh i guess not quite shown right people could cross and walk up here and then have a direct connection yep in terms of down to mcclellan right through here is where um the tan brook passes through kendrick park mm -hmm. and so Originally, you know, the thought was like, okay, let's let's put a crossing right almost directly across, but then you're at a mid block. And mm. it's so the, the the idea right now is to, you know, um, if you brought down to McClellan, mm -hmm. um, Public Works is talking about having um, 
whether this be a whole raised intersection now with a, a larger raised crosswalk for traffic calming. And then uh, there's some utilities right here. There's a um, sewer and manhole um, and drainage, both sewer and drainage infrastructure that you, we have to avoid. So, you know, that's why it's coming to the south of the McClellan Street. It's really trying to avoid any any possibility of, of um, running into Tan Brook. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, I, I understand that it's kind of a, the dog leg that comes quite far south, but I hope in reality, it, you know, it's an easy connection for people walking Mm -hmm. um, you know, they can, you know, be at a, you know, an act, you know, at a cross street, they can cross mm -hmm. and come up. Right. Because in the winter, that is the only place that will be plowed as far as. Right. So yeah, this whole walkway will be plowed. Right. Okay. And it's, it, this, this topography also allows, um, or this shape, there's a, quite a bit of topography right here. Mm -hmm. And so the shape coming like this allows it to be a sloped walkway and not a ramp or it doesn't need stairs. So oh, gotcha. uh -huh. there will be some fill brought in here, but again, essentially this will be, um, you know, uh, an accessible walkway. If we came straight off here, this is quite oh. steep, right where the cursor is. And so, okay. if the if the if the walkway came straight, there'd be a number of stairs, and then we'd still need to have an accessible route. So this, right. you know, tries to satisfy it with one design. Mm -hmm. Okay, All right. thanks. Nate, is there still talk of turning because DPW is involved in this uh, North Pleasant Street, making it a one way? That hasn't been a part of the discussion. I mean, we've we've discussed. We've mentioned what's happening long term, but that there hasn't been any real discussion on that. I think, um, you know, in the 2011 plan, they showed you know angled parking right in here, mm -hmm. and making this one way. And so I think all those things are still you know under consideration. I don't I don't really know what the long term plan is. Thanks. Um, I'm gonna uh, recognize um, Janet, and then Michael will be next. Um, so Nate, I have a question um, prompted by what Maria was saying is if people are coming from the north um, or across the street um, of East Pleasant where you know all the buildings are right now and probably future buildings, mm -hmm. is there going to be a raised crosswalk towards the entrance? Like first, how would people from the north come? Would mm -hmm. they be across the street or I think there's a sidewalk running along the park, right? There is. And then there's, there's a crosswalk right here. Okay. So, you know, if you are on the other side, you can cross here and then it's not too far down. And then there's this new sidewalk all along the north. Is there, is there thinking about raising that crosswalk to sort of slow traffic down and give people a chance to get across? Not, not that I'm aware of, but I'll make a note of it. Yeah, thank you. Nate, could you um, switch to that uh, 2011 plan again? Sure. Um, Janet's question made me think uh, thank you. Yes. You know, in that one, there was, so I'm thinking about people walking not north, like from the campus way, like how I would walk down that way. You know, there it shows some very graceful sidewalks that could bring you down into the park. Um, but at this point, it looks like in the new design, they would have to walk all the way down to McClellan and get into it that way. You're right. So yeah, right now there's no existing sidewalk on the west side of Kendrick Park. And so just in terms of, you know, not having, if we show this, you know, keeping this at grade allows for a connection, but, you know, there isn't money in the budget to then create a sidewalk that goes all the way up to this intersection. So that, that was really outside the scope of the play area. Um, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're allowing for that connection in the future, but not, right. not at this time. So, so can yeah, you add think, that to phase two? <laughs> yeah, phase two. It's interesting, right? For someone coming north, you know, they right now the sidewalk does not, you know, it really follows the perimeter, the curb edge, and it would come around here. So someone would have to, you know, walk around the north and then the east, you know, or they right, could come down North Pleasant and then come up a bit. Um, those are the two sidewalks. Okay, thanks. I'm going to recognize Michael. There. Um, going back to the cover sheet that you showed a minute ago, I was, uh, another question about that same sidewalk. Um, the, the, uh, the, there's the suggestion that the park would be uh, closed at, at, from, uh, from uh, dusk to dawn, uh, that it wouldn't be available at that point. And so if there's no fencing, uh, clearly closing it is, is uh, uh, a matter of public perception rather than about rather than patrolling. But would you would you imagine that that sidewalk from that cut, connects McClellan Street and uh, ends up on East Pleasant uh, 
would be available and usable during the evening hours or not? Uh, good question. I um, I would assume I would assume yes. You know, the, we're, we're providing um, you know pedestrian level lighting there. Um, you know, and to your point about the playground, you know, it's interesting. At one point, we talked about would we have um, you know ballers at either entrance here. Not that you chain it off, but you could have some signs. I would say close at dusk. I think that um, but my, I envision that the the you know the sidewalk here would be illuminated and used you know in the evening um i'm sure that's going to your point of when how is the park closed <laughs> yeah yeah but thank you mm -hmm. i recognize david and um, um thank david. you okay and then chris you're next thanks nate and for the rest of the team for putting together this proposal that's trying to maximize state funding I, I just i mean not to be too contrarian it's in my mind it's not that lar large a park and it's not that large a play area um and so minimizing the the um added paving or um and and i i think is 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 an asset rather than a detriment because the more we talk about adding walkways, I think that from the north side, people will be, if they, they can walk across the field that remains, which is nice, or they can walk on the neighboring, the, the adjacent uh, uh, sidewalks on the streets where their cars may be or likely parked. So I, I think that that's actually an, uh, an asset to the, the, the current design or the current view. Um, rather than uh, uh, anything else. And so I, I, I applaud minimizing the um, uh, added macadam. I think, that's, I think that's pretty much it. Thank you. Thanks. Chris Bester. Hello. Um, so we have heard from um, the DPW, and I think this was uh, a comment that the um, superintendent Guilford Mooring made, that if we put up a sign that said the playground is closed from dusk to dawn, and we alerted the police to that um, fact, that they would drive by, and if they saw people, you know, playing there or doing things that weren't appropriate or whatever, students going through there at night, that they would um, tell them that the playground is closed and they can't be in the playground. I don't think that will apply to the path that goes across it because people do use that you know to get from the neighborhoods to the west of Kendrick Park over to uh, the stores and the um, buildings and bus and bike share on the east side of Kendrick Park so I have a feeling that the walkway would still be open but um, as long as there's a sign up to clue the police in and, and we let them know that we don't want people there after dark they will uh, patrol it and um, try to keep people out of there. Thanks, Chris. I see no more hands up right now for board members, so I was going to move it to public comments. Um, so I'm looking at, we have 28 attendees right now on Zoom, and I will ask them to raise their hand if they have a question about um, the park. I see, okay. I see two hands right now. Um, so I will recognize you, um, or at least what I see on the screen. So please introduce yourself and uh, where you reside and then ask your question. I, and I see three hands now. So I'll start with um, Dorothy Pam. So unmute yourself and introduce yeah, I'm yourself. To do that. Oh, yep. I did it. Give it up. Good. Okay. So Dorothy, you should, are you there, Dorothy? Dorothy, do you, um, do you hear us? Hear you. Hear okay. You. Is that noise going to go away? Now we have back feed. If you, do you have Is something? Your telephone perhaps. Is your telephone close by? Yes. Yeah. But I, I don't remember where I wrote the number down. Oh, excuse me. Um, I have a phone. A 
Okay, I wrote the numbers down. Let me see if I can find them. You, do you want me to come back to you, Dorothy, in a few minutes? Okay, I'll, I'll, yeah, hold on. Let me just see if I can't make this all work. I'm, I'm having, I'll try it again. I'll come back to you. I'll go to the other two people and I'll come back. Okay. Thank Thanks. You. Um, Mr. Uh, Plashaskov. Are you there? I think uh, Pam, is he unmuted? He will be. There <laughs> yep. we go. He is. Hello, I'm, oh, yeah, Konstantin Plashakov. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome. Uh, yes, great. Thank you. And if you could uh, say your address again and then yeah. ask your question. Uh, 289 Triangle Street, just north of the of uh, Kendrick Park. I'm uh, very interested to know, uh, did uh, the current COVID-19 pandemic influence your planning in the past few weeks. I understand that uh, this is a project with the history started in 2011. Clearly that was a different time. So now we are under statewide lockdown and health experts tell us that it's likely that the situation will continue for a year or maybe two. So my questions are number one, um, did you think about the most effective way to shut down the area in case there is an emergency situation as it's now? Putting up signs will possibly, you know, work on families, but definitely not on uh, young people who will be also using the, you know, the area on their own. So I really, you know, I'm, you know, I'm really asking you to think about the fence. I know that it's not ideal, but it would, if there's a fence and the location could be physically put under lockdown if necessary, that would do a lot for public safety of the, for, for the health of the community. And number two, uh, do you, you know, did you have, you know, time to figure out the protocols for disinfecting the area daily? I understand that the earliest it will open will be uh, summer next year, but chances are that uh, the situation with the pandemic will not get, uh, you know, completely resolved, or there may be another way. So, when we think about maintenance, I think we're also looking at the necessity for daily maintenance, uh, disinfecting the surfaces, right? Particularly it's a playground, kids, right? So um, those are my uh, two questions. So I would be really grateful if you could address them. Uh, thank you. Um, Nate, do you wanna answer that? I, and I just, part of it is we have other parks in town. How is that? Is there a plan how that's going to be handled? Nate? <laughs> Is Nate still with us? Or Chris, do you want to answer that? Yep. Maybe Nate's not listening. So, um, sorry, I, I think. I, I, oh. I didn't realize I was muted. Sorry, Chris and everyone. <laughs> that's okay. So let Nate I, have a chance. Okay. My um my computer was chiming, so I, I I wasn't sure. I think I was getting emails. But anyway, so the um, yeah. Uh, thanks for your comments. The uh, I was gonna say that I was saying that the town takes you know safety of its residents and visitors very seriously, and I've, I you know I think they've done a commendable job. You know, in terms of uh, Christine, you mentioned the other parks. I mean, the town went you know closed its uh, public um, parks in an effort to, you know, stop social gatherings and then also to ease maintenance. So, you know, if this park um, were constructed at this time, again, it would be, you know, a patrol issue, but, you know, all public parks in an emergency like this would just be closed. We wouldn't, 
allow you know them to be open um because you know the I, I do think the daily disinfecting is something that we haven't discussed and you know i think the easier solution is not to is to close them because that's that's the safest measure the um i understand people will still come you know i read what in sweden where they spread chicken manure in the park to to deter the uh basically like the may day celebration um I, but yeah I, I mean so i think you know we haven't discussed that directly um same with uh, you know also to like the fence or how what's the effective way if there's another emergency you know we're not necessarily designing this park with an eye toward um you know having to keep users a certain distance i mean if this were open people there's plenty of space for people to you know have social distancing occur um you know if there was another health emergency like this my thought is the town would close public spaces and, and make it pretty apparent that it's not to be used I, you know i don't I can't say, you know, what what are the measures the town would use at that time? I mean, if people continue to use it, you know, would it be, you know, more patrols in this area? Would it be putting up temporary fencing, you know, chain link fencing, like construction fencing? I mean, those are things we haven't really discussed. Thank you. I'm going to move to Hilda Greenbaum. I believe you are able to speak. Not yet. Okay. Now um, she can. Okay. Hello, can Hilda. I can yeah. hear you now. Please introduce yourself and ask. Oh, Hilda Greenbaum, uh, two ninety eight Montague Road, North Amherst. I have a question about the sidewalks and whether they would be tricycle and baby carriage easily, uh, not necessarily accessible, but pushable. And that's emanating from my many years of pushing grandchildren around, especially Amity Street. When I, when I look at the number of tree roots that have made pushing a carriage up Amity Street next to impossible, that I see there are a lot of trees planted, or bushes, it's hard to tell, planted very close to the walking paths here, whether you're going to have the same kinds of upheaval of the pavement that we suffer on Amity Street. So I just wanted to make sure that people were thinking about that when they planned the plantings along the sidewalks. Thank you. And so the, you know, the sidewalks are, you know, we're building them, you know, five to six feet wide. So they are, you know, wide enough, they will be a, a smooth surface so that they could be used by, you know, different whether it's toys or assistive devices, the um, for tree roots, you know what the town's done in some areas, and you know it, it, it um, um, you know it's the freezing and thawing and other things that happen along tree roots that you know sometimes the roots themselves that heave the sidewalk. So a lot of it goes into the sub base material. If you you know the towns tried different methods with um, you know different um, gravel or sub base material that has um, you know voids in them to allow you know things to expand or move. So um, you know, like Chris had mentioned, we're working with Public Works on this design, both the tree warden and an engineer. Um, so my assumption is they've designed the, the walkways and the, you know, the sub-base materials in a way that it would allow for both the roots to survive and then also to, um, you know, any, to remediate any heaving, you know, to, you know, and that could be also just, you know, more scoring patterns and joints on a sidewalk. So, you know, concrete will or asphalt sometimes can break, but if you have um, control joints and expansion joints, so there's a few ways to plan for that. I'm not, you know, I we haven't, that hasn't been talked about. Um, well, as long either. as you're aware that there yeah. is that problem in Amherst. <laughs> aware. <laughs> aware, made aware. A lot of people make you aware. No, that, that's good, thanks. I, that's <clears throat> something we can bring back. Um, Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to uh, Dorothy. I do not see your hand up, but I'll give you this moment. You are unmuted if you want to speak. I think she has herself muted. I have her unmute. unmute. If she's listening, um, if not, I'll try one more time. I see one more hand. Um, I see um, Kathy Schoen. Schoen. Kathy Shane. Shane, that's right. I was like, it's not like how it looks. Okay, Shane. Kathy Shane. Um, she, uh, you're allowed to speak now. Wait a minute. <laughs> Hold on. Speaking. Okay. Now she should be. 
Okay, Kathy, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, um, I'm Kathy Shane. I live at 519 Montague Road, and I think you know I'm also on the town council, but I'm speaking as a resident. Um, I just, um, I want to uh, echo what I think David Levinson said is, in this case, trying to minimize the cost and minimize the amount of paving and other things we put in this is important, um, rather than maximize the grant even. Because I, I think the issue of us maintaining, um, you can look around our other parks and see what happens to equipment, not to mention just the grass. So I do have a question about the rubberized surface and I can see how big it has to be. And it partly has to be as big as it is because the amount of equipment that's on it. So potentially less equipment would mean less rubberized surface. And it's so expensive to put in that even if it has a 20 year lifetime, if it costs $200,000, we may not replace it given the way Amherst does it. So just those two are interactive. Then on the table, I'm wondering whether it may be that it's just more expensive, but um, when you look at a central park and some of the parks that have playground or play area, they put in stone tables where there's a stone top on a stone pedestal and they've been there forever. Um, and the table I saw with the four attached chairs is that aluminum. And is there a way to think a little bit more creatively about tables? Because I do think tables are important, even if they're small, people sit down at them. It's a nice place to gather um, and talk with people. And then the last is, if is there, I think there's still a sand lot in the when I was looking this afternoon and um, keeping the sand clean is for the one time we lived near a playground that had sand and when we lived in DC the one place that was completely destroyed was the sand lot because pets pets had gone in it there was debris in it um, cigarette butts and other things in it so just thinking in terms of sand doesn't necessarily stay clean and you want it to stay clean so it's the whole theme is around maintenance that's it mm -hmm. Nate. the um no i think those are good points you know um we are we are talking to a, um you know one uh, a stone uh manufacturer and distributor to get costs on items so we could um ask about tables. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that, um, you know, a stone table would be more expensive than a, than the aluminum, but you never know. Um, so we can look at that and even different ideas for different types of tables. Um, yeah, the sand, it's interesting. We, there still may be a sand area and we've talked about maintenance. So we've also suggested uh, maybe if, um, you know, there's a P-stone area and we thought about if the sand was to go away, it would just be p -stone. we'd um, have P-stone instead of sand. It's a little, it's different, but it's still tactile and kids can play and dig in it. Um, hopefully it's, you know, not as much of a maintenance issue. So I, I, I understand, I hear that about the sand. I haven't, um, you know, I, I just, I'll take note of that. Cats don't like the pea stone as much as the sand. <laughs> um, I think that was, um, so I'm going to go back to Dorothy Pam and if you can try to, thanks Pam. I believe she is unmuted. Yes. Can, can you hear me now? Dorothy, Amherst Media um, sent me a message and said to remind folks that they need to turn their telephone down, the volume, um, their speakers down, and TVs down before they speak. If you have either of those going, so okay, this, is that better? I turned the volume down. I'm on my computer. I tried the phone. The phone does not let one in. I put, I typed in the meeting ID number, and then it asked me for my personal ID. And all that it was said in the directions was type, um, what was it, space nine. I did that and it wouldn't accept me in. So the telephone does not work. Okay. So I'm ready to, I guess that's a simple question about the tables with the attached chairs. If one were wanting to do some social distancing, you could not do so with those four attached chairs. No. I understand why movable chairs might be a problem, but let's just say that you're a grandparent wanting to watch your grandchildren 
but we're still in a half kind of social distancing world. So maybe there could be some permanent individual chairs, like, like, like a stone chair that is not so close to some other things. I mean, I, I realize this is in contradiction to Christine's point, which was good, which you wanted a space for a, a group of mothers and children to eat lunch while playing. But the attached four chairs did seem to present a problem to me. Uh, the other issue is, for price reasons, you have decided to not do the natural materials for the play structure. But the, the pictured equipment was my most hated color, beige gray plastic color. So I know that the public at one of the meetings I went to didn't want it to be those bright, too many bright primary colors. But what about making the equipment just that old fashioned dark playground green? And then it would blend in with the trees. And I think that would look a lot better. But basically, I'm very excited about the park. And I hope it will be built soon. And I hope that we will come up with a fundraising process to build a beautiful restroom at the tip. Because there's no way that children that I know could ever make it to any of the bathrooms you listed without wetting their pants. So I do think we need a, a, a restroom at some point. That's Thank it. you, Ms. Pam. Thank you. Um, wow, my head's ringing. Um, <laughs> yeah, I like you know I, I like the idea about you know movable chairs. You know, everyone, everyone you know a lot of talk goes into that. Um, you know, for the play equipment, the color, yeah, the colors can change. I mean, there's a, a lot of colors. I, I almost want to say too many color choices, but the um, you know, one vendor caution gets too dark of materials because it gets hot in the sun. And so there is a discussion about what are the right color choices and even, you know, changing some of that um, equipment a little bit. Right. We, um, Hold up, uh, I need a sec. Pam, can you put up the playground or maybe I, you can, I, maybe I can um, just to show those colors. I know there was some like lime green in there. Um, oh, you know, sorry, same thing. Um, what's wrong with lime green? No, uh, I think, just, uh, you know, just wanted to show it. Yep. No, I think, yeah, it's, I, my hope too would be that um, the colors maybe read pretty, um, you know, quite bright and artificial on here, and it could just be the way it's presented. I mean, I, I agree that it's, um, you know, at, during the forums, everyone had talked about, um, you know, whether it's more muted colors or something that's not as bright and thematic. Um, so that's something we can consider. Yeah, and just when people are talking about colors, Ani, um, like if you stop there for a sec, you know, there's posts, you know, she said she doesn't, I think the putty or the brown color, where I think some of the slides and such, they sort of almost only come in those colors, like this is something that might, you might want to, you know, delineate out and find out what are the selections, because um, there we see lime green, you know, some parts of the pieces must come in colors, but some pieces may have a very limited um, number of colors. You know, like so I think, you know, the, the vendor did get hot. You know, what the vendor did here. This was a. Um, this is probably one of their standard color palettes. So you mm -hmm. know they have um, like gray or silver posts, and then a few, few different colors. And so, um, you know, they've said that almost anything can be customizable. Probably not mm -hmm. at a cost. It's just you'd have to, you know, go through and choose it. So, I think there's like five different um, color uh, colors on, say for instance, this play structure. Um, you know, there's posts, there's this plastic, there's climbing, there's caps, and there's the surface. And so I think any of that, I think those can, I agree that, you know, the slide material maybe have, you know, six different colors, yeah. um, you know, and then this metal, this green right here, there might be 30 different colors. And so it's just a matter of, of choosing a palette that works and, um, you know, can, it, you know, can maybe be more subdued. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, and just, uh, if we have another map, you know, I was talking about the table, ironically, the circle there has a picture. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it, the, you mentioned that stone area in that circle, that's sort of like what you got, uh, the DPW is planning to do, you know, so she was, you know, if people are in that circle and they couldn't, didn't want to sit at a table, they can sit on the stone benching. Right. Right. And, and you'll have other benches nearby. You know, you said that a couple of times that you definitely yeah, so we, want to have a lot of benches. Yeah, so this this mock-up right here, you know, we envisioned a sign here, a bench here, 
you know, what we've talked about here is creating a, a better edge along this by doubling up benches here just to create more, um, you know, more seating and then also more of a barrier. The, um, you know, movable chairs is interesting. The, um, you know, one of the designs for the North Common had a plaza with movable chairs, um, just so, you know, people can, can sit how they'd like. Um, so it's, I mean, it's something I think we can discuss as a team, as a design team. I lived near a new park in California and they did put in some movable chairs, very heavy, not more than aluminum. They were some kind of metal that was very <laughs> heavy. And they did have them chained, which made them hard to move, um, but that was for theft. But unfortunately, by the end of two years, they were all magically gone. Um, mm. So I know that's a concern. You, you don't want your furniture to travel. Right. Um, so, you know. Maybe ask the vendor. I think the vendor would would have a lot of insight on that. About right. I mean, even at the, those that uh, round table and those chairs, I think it's a they weigh, it weighs three hundred fifty pounds as a set, and so wow. we talked about not <laughs> bolting them, but having them be you know loose. I mean, they kind of can't really be moved, but I think some, one of the um, when we were talking about it for Groff, someone said, well, you know, someone could pick it up. I'm like, okay, if someone is really intent on stealing something that weighs three hundred fifty pounds, they could try to drive on there with a pickup truck and a bunch of guys. Or people and move it but i'm like really i'm like really i mean 350 pounds really that just seems but oh nate you're making me gonna say it how many college kids does it take to move a table <laughs> we'll ask some extra weight we'll make them about 500 pounds maybe and see what happens um, all right thank you um so i don't see um uh, looking back. Oh, I see two more questions. Um, you see them, Pam. I'm, I'll go with I Karen do. Winter first, if you can give her. Um, okay, so I believe it's Karen Winter, but please uh, introduce Hi. yourself. I'm Karen Winter. I live at 14 Elm Street. Okay. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this playground, but now that I see the playground equipment, my heart kind of sinks because this is exactly what I was hoping was not going to happen. It looks like a lot of plastic and metal. And um, I sent to Dorothy Pam because I wasn't sure who else to send to a lot of pictures of playgrounds in Berlin and Germany. And I don't know how long, how far along is this whole thing. I'm just thinking of completely different kinds of things like the rubber trampolines for kids that are built into the ground, which my daughter who lives there says is the absolute hit with all the parents. It's not that expensive. You see it all over Europe now. And then just stone blocks for people to, to, to climb on. You know, this seems to me, I, I don't know, I'm probably too late and maybe this is a cost thing, but my heart is just kind of sinking looking everything else looks great i love the idea of your walkways the flowers the grading the minimal impact but the play equipment is not what i was hoping to see so i don't know is that a done deal thank you for your question um nate yeah i mean i think this play area um, I've changed screens is, you know, we'll have manufactured equipment, but as we've discussed, there's many other elements here that will have all natural, whether it's stone uh, seating or, um, you know, wood chips and logs, you know, pea stone and granite blocks. And so there's, you know, another, some more stone seating area. So there'll be areas of natural material integrated throughout, you know, this amphitheater area. Uh, in terms of the play equipment, the design team, you know, we're, um, it is plastic and metal, but it's also both, you know, accessible and usable for different age groups and it meets the safety standard. So Corinne, thanks for your emails. We did forward them and looked at them from Europe, but I mean, they have completely different safety standards. So those trampolines that are at grade, I understand they're, um, they look a lot of, like a lot of fun, but you know, as far as I understand, they wouldn't be allowed. They would not meet safety standards. So there's, um, you know, it is hard to look at other, um, other playgrounds. So, you know, even um, when we were doing Groff Park, I found some images from, yeah, from Germany and England for different water parks. And, you know, when I spoke with different safety officials, they said, well, actually here in, um, in America, that's considered a pool, not a stream. So you'd have to have a lifeguard, even though it really is just like, you know, a little wading pool. So um, I think, 
you know, the different safety standards and regulations um, do make it difficult to implement things that you might see abroad. Um, but my thought is that this area, you know, really is an accessible play area. So the play equipment, you know, there's accessible items that has different age groups. And then there's, you know, all natural material that's integrated and, you know, scattered throughout the, the rest of the area. So, um, you know, in terms of the dedication to materials, I mean, this is maybe a third of the playground area. And so most of it would actually be, to me, would be considered, you know, a more naturalized um, play area. So, you know, grass mounds and gravel and stones and, you know, the agility area would be logs and stumps. Yeah, I understand, but <laughs> to me, that's the heart of the playground. It's the playground. But yes, I guess I, I don't know anything about safety standards. If it's not possible, it's not possible. I mean, every um, vendor we've spoken with, they do not, they no longer use natural wood because it, it ages, it splinters, it rots within 10 years. It may need to be treated every year with different chemicals. So um, we have, we've asked three, a few different vendors and they've all said, you know, they, maybe 20 years ago, they tried it and they've all stopped carrying it. So the best they would do would be a synthetic wood um, you know, synthetic material tried to m make it look like w wood or rock, and that's very expensive. Um, I see. And what about rock climbing things th that are made out of stone, some creative kind of a stone? Yeah, I see. That's in a different part. Okay. Thank you, Nate. Yeah, yeah the rock. Uh, 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 Nate, just to adding on to that, you mentioned, oh, we, you know, talked to three different vendors. So, and the pitches you have, I assume, are from one vendor who works right. with certain manufacturers. Um, did you look at other manufacturers or other vendors and was this the the look and feel, the aesthetics um, that, or was it price? Like, you know, why are you leaning towards this? Yeah, the vendor, the images we showed, the, we, we like the vendor, we worked with them before, they're just responsive and, you know, they do have a lot more um, equipment then that was shown here. So it's a matter now of pushing them a little bit. So these were done, you know, kind of for free just to show what they're capable of. The other vendors, yeah, I mean, we, I, I really asked for one, um, you know, anywhere from three to five designs, one being all natural material, and then the other two with, you know, manufactured and none of them provided an all natural design because they say they just don't do it. So, um, you know, they were all somewhat similar to be honest. I mean, it, I guess it's just a matter of, you know, some vendors um, might carry the, the tables I showed where others are going to do more wood tables or picnic table style. Um, you know, and, and so there's small variations between them. Um, you know, um, because we use this vendor at different parks, you know, all the, the uh, mechanical equipment, the fasteners, all that stuff is the same. I mean, there may be some, you know, ease of maintenance if, you know, for instance, end caps can be replaced universally throughout the parks in Amherst, as opposed to having each park be um, unique or, um, but yeah, I, I do think it's interesting. The, um, you know, we looked at Pulaski, we looked at different parks and, um, it, it is, it's, you can have natural materials, but to have a play structure that's really built up that has slides and everything else there, what, you know, we haven't found someone that's willing to quote, build one out of natural wood, you know, it's going to be a manufactured, uh, play structure. Thank you. I see one more hand in the um, attendees, uh, Pam, uh, Greta, yeah. and Bruce. Yeah. So that you should be able to speak and introduce yourself or selves, whoever's there. Yeah, hi, it's Bruce Wilcox. Uh, hi, Bruce. Speaking. Um, I just want to say how thrilled I am that there's going to be a playground downtown. We've waited many years for this and uh, when our grandchildren are in town, I'm sure we'll be walking over. I'm on Lincoln Avenue. Uh, I had a couple of comments. One, I'd like to second Dorothy, Dorothy Pam's point about uh, restrooms. I realize it's not within the purview of your present scheme, but something's got to be done about that. And I wonder if any large buildings are built across the street, if a requirement could be added that they include a public restroom. Again, that's not something you can uh, determine today, but I just throw that out there as an idea. Uh, the other point is that uh, when we visit our grandchildren who are in San Francisco, every one of the public parks has a sign as you enter the playground that says only um, 
those who are accompanied by children may come in the playground, that adults can't just hang there on their own. I think that's actually a good idea in a college town. And I wonder if that's anything that uh, you had given any thought to. Thank you. I had forgotten about that San Francisco rule. Yeah. Um, Nate, do you have any comments on those or Chris? No. Um, you know, we hadn't talked about that limiting, you know, the users. Typically, we just say it's open to the public and, you know, without really restriction unless there is, you know, unless someone's trying to vandalize or, you know, it's after hours or something. But um, again, something to consider. It is. I will say the parks that I was familiar with in San Francisco, they were completely fenced. So they could be closed at night. And that was part of it by entering you had a child with you. Where this one, it's even with some fencing, it would still be very open, but it's a good concept. Um, all right. So I I do see some uh, board members have their hands. I'm going to recognize Christine. Chris, my... Christine, can I interrupt you? Oh, yep. Should I we click? have um, someone has put um, a question in the Q&A, which I did not believe was possible. Yeah. So it was accessible here. So it's a person yeah. Um, yeah. who is still attending. I'm not sure if that person wants to speak for himself or. Well, um, it can be lumped in. So I was going to, if I recognize Chris, I also wanted to mention that we have gotten other comments via email and um, I think the website and we got a lot of them um, emailed to us today. I did read through them all. I haven't given them all a hard thought yet, um, but I want to ask Chris, how should we start handling those? I know this isn't the only meeting, hearing meeting that we're having. I, I wanted to say that um, this is the first of probably two public hearing sessions on this project. We're not um, complete in our design, but we wanted to start out and give you all the information we had so far. But we're going to recommend that you continue this public hearing to um, your next meeting, which is May 20th. And at that time, you might want to um, you know, read through or summarize the comments that you've received online and that have been um, emailed to us. And uh, you know, mention the names of the people if you can figure that out. Um, but that might be a good time to, to handle that. And, and you really don't need to feel like you have to wrap this up tonight because we don't have all the answers that you're looking for or that we hoped to present to you. Great, so that would give the board members some time to you know, we receive all of the comments, so we can not only read them, we can think about it, and that will adjust possibly the questions we ask at the next meeting. Um, Pam, so back to that Q&A question. So there's no name attached or anything? There is. I'm actually trying to send them a message right now to, to see if they want to um, speak during the public comment. Okay, we can wait and can flick back to them. Um, I'll move to back to some of the board members. I see, I see three hands up, and I believe I saw Janet's go up earlier uh, first. So I recognize Janet. Thank you. Um, I just had a quick question or an idea. There seems to be a lot of public interest in the park, and I know it's in progress. And being Nate and the. Um, DPW and planning department being very responsive to comments. Is there some way to kind of post this information and keep people current, not minute by minute, but, you know, people are very interested. And is there a place on the website, the planning department website that, you know, the latest plans can go or, you know, in a week or so or something like that, just to keep people informed? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah, there's a, there is actually a product web page, and I think we could, we could benefit it benefit um, by updating it and we could do that um, soon and then um, you know we, we it's, it's linked to the LSSC commissions um, they have a um, like a what's happening or a, a kind of a, a another um, kind of page on their site so it's linked to a few different areas so that even to the public works um, current project so I think we could update that and maybe put it in the news again and just kind of put it out there yeah, maybe even on the town crawl. I mean, it's a very positive development in a time when there's a lot of um, other not so positive things. And I think people are very interested. So it'd be nice to show 
what what the town is working on and things moving ahead and also you know obviously you're taking people's comments very seriously so they could you know people can participate so i appreciate that no, thanks yeah thanks nate um next i recognize david uh, thank you i'd like to move to continue to close the public hearing and to continue this to the next meeting um there's been a lot of input there's still a june 1 deadline there's been a lot of work already put on this we uh, have a, a a sizable topic following and so i'd like to make that motion thank you um so i have hands up I, i'm gonna just call on michael whether he wants to second that or if he would like to ask his question he did have his hand up before this so i'll, I'll second the motion okay thank you michael um, and then I recognize Chris Bestrup, her hand is up. So I just wanted to um, note that you shouldn't close the public hearing because you will be um, admitting new evidence next time around, but um, certainly uh, moving to continue the public hearing to um, May, May 20th would be a, a great idea. That's what he Thank asked. you for clarification, Chris. <laughs> And it is seconded. So um, at this point, I don't see any other hands. So we will continue this probably at the next meeting, Chris, in two weeks. Yes, that's right. Okay. Yep. Right. Okay. So at this point, Nate, thank you. That's a lot. Um, thanks sure. for all your hard work. Um, we look forward to seeing kind of the final draft. Great. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, Pam. So I think it'll go back to you if you want to. And. Mm -hmm. Okay. Christine, we need to do a, a roll call vote. For continuing. Oh, continuing, yeah. Yes. Let me get my little. Okay, that's right. Thank you. So um, that's on the table right now to just continue the hearing until the 20th. So I will do a quick roll call. Um, so I'll start with um, Michael. Yes. Maria. Yes. Jack. Yes. Yay. Uh, David. Yes. Doug? Affirmative. Janet? Yes. And um, I also, yes. So that's unanimous. Move to two weeks from now. So we'll move on to the next thing on our agenda, which is um, item four, chapter 40, our smart growth. Um, Karen Sunnerborg, housing and planning consultant, and David Eisen, architect of Ab. Abcus uh, Architects and Planners present a review of the Chapter 40R Smart Growth Study and propose draft zoning amendments, including design standards. And I know Chris Bestrup mentioned that she would like to um, speak first. So Thank Chris, you. yeah. Thank you, Christine. I, I just wanted to give a brief introduction so that people know what we're doing tonight. Um, in uh, 2019, the town of Amherst received a planning for housing production grant from uh, Mass Housing, and they contracted with, we contracted with Karen Sonneberg and um, David Eisen of Abacus Architects and Planners to analyze zoning and um, give us some input about affordable housing development opportunities. So we've held um, three public meetings so far, one last April, one in June, and one in December. And we've heard a lot about what, uh, what is smart growth, what is chapter 40R. Um, we've gotten a lot of good information. We got a lot of input from the public at those three meetings. And now um, the planning board uh, wanted to have an opportunity to um, find out a little bit more about 40R and discuss it among themselves because some planning board members weren't able to go to any of those public forums and um, the planning board uh, is feeling that they would um, like to have an opportunity to talk about this. Even the people who did go to those public forums couldn't talk about it with their fellow planning board members. So that's what this is all about. Um, we're gonna have a presentation from the two consultants and then there will be an opportunity for planning board members to ask questions and to um, discuss this uh, possible proposal but I wanted to make the uh, point very clear 
that this is not um, something that is uh, a firm proposal that's coming before the planning board. This is not a public hearing, although you may wish to hear comments from the public. The planning board will not be making any decisions tonight other than possibly to uh, continue to look into this um, 40R as a, as a proposal. But um, I think you know some people were worried that this was kind of um, moving too quickly and there wouldn't be enough opportunity for public input. So this is really just an opportunity for the planning board to hear about it, planning board to discuss, and then if there are public comments and you wanna um, receive those, you can do that. But there will be plenty of other opportunity to talk about this in public forums. So Chris, before you introduce the consultant, um, so just to be clear, this so they're coming today just to present what they've been working on and um, are they done with this or do they plan to do yet another public um, talk, you know, um, or would it be down the road if decisions were made on to do something with 40R, then there would be more meetings for the public and, and reach out. So I'm not really sure about that. I haven't really talked to the consultants of themselves about this. My understanding is that they um, were intending to do another public forum, a fourth public forum, and they have graciously agreed to have this meeting with the planning board, um, specifically with the planning board. Um, but uh, you know, the actual uh, determination of whether they will be coming back or whether it will be on staff to make presentations is to be determined. Um, so, so I'm going to leave that as an open question, but I hope that they will be able to come back and give a presentation to the public and have the public, in, you know, give their input. Certainly the intent um, on the part of planning department staff is that there will be many opportunities to talk about this in, in a public forum, whether or not the consultants are there. Right. So they're a resource that are coming to us today mm -hmm. and we can ask hard questions to them about 40R. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay. Oh, so, so I should introduce them. Yes. Um, Chris, with us. Chris oh. can I ask you to wait just a second? Yes. So I have been able to bring over David Eisen into the panelists. Um, I'm not sure if Karen is here. We have one person in attendees right. named Karen. Just just Karen, so I'm going to ask that person to speak a second. <laughs> Who are you, Karen? <laughs> Karen? Is I'm this? Karen Sonneborg. I'm here. All right, Karen, I'm going to move you over to the panelists right now. Thank you. Is, is this a good time to introduce the consultants? Yes, I'm sorry, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, so we're very pleased to have with us tonight Karen Sonneborg and David Eisen, who have been working with us since um, probably the, the winter, or actually maybe even the fall and summer of 2018 and all through 2019, um, and uh, you know, participating in these public forums, which everybody, you know, a lot of people had an opportunity to attend. Um, so Karen and David, please give your presentation, and then I'm sure the planning board and the public will have some questions. Thank you. I just want to ask uh, Pam, or who is uh, in charge of the slides? Nate, are you there? I have it up right at the moment, um, so I can I can run with it. Okay. So yeah, thank, yeah, thanks, Pam. Yeah, I I I, I I'm, you know I saw the looks like I could you know help point if the are um are you I don't know uh, Pam. Did we ever figure that out? How I could also do it? I I don't have that access right now. You you should just be able to do, give it a try. Um, no, I'm viewing your screens, but I'm not sure if I can actually do anything with it. Um, oh, okay, you should from, be able to an, an, annotate it if you look up at the top. I'm going to take request remote control from your screen. Oh, all right. Yeah, that'll work. You can take it <laughs> and just tell, give them one okay. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But now you have to get rid of the pencil I made. <laughs> okay. All right. Do you want me to do want, Pam? Do you want me to want me to um, move it forward and everything? And you can. 
you if if you're willing to that would be great and then i will stick up watching for a yeah, hand i can and do that taking notes yep perfect okay so i see um david his screen his video's off and he's able to speak and where's the karen karen this is my voice coming through it is now hello okay I don't see my picture. Uh, I don't know if that's a big loss. Uh, can you turn on your can uh, your video on the bottom left? Is it got a line? Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Great. Right. Um, okay. And Great. Pam, I don't see the Karen yet in the panelists. I can't get to my panelist thing right all of a sudden. Oh, yeah. She's she. Um, go. So Is Pam me at least. I do hear you, Karen, but hold on a moment. So Pam, I see that you've given her talking permission, but she's still in attendees. Huh. So we okay. don't have a screen for her. Hold on. Promote to panelist. There she goes. Great. Austin. So Karen. Lois has promoted you as a panelist. Okay. And if Karen, you if you wanna if you wanna turn on your video, you can go down to the bottom left and yeah. turn on the video screen. There we go. Ah, fantastic. Welcome. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hello. Welcome. Thank you. So should we get on with it, with the uh, presentation? The floor is yours. And Excellent. Nate is driving your uh, slides, so. Great. Well, thanks for Chris, uh, to Chris for the introduction, for Nate and Pam on the technical support, and uh, you folks for putting us on your agenda uh, this evening. Uh, uh, David and I are going to go through this slideshow as uh, expeditiously as we can, so we have time for questions and comments. Uh, the focus of the presentation is to really look at, you know, where we've come, where we are now, and a little bit on where we where we're headed. Um, next slide. Yeah. So you know. Okay. It, um, sorry. It does work. All right. I was just. Is that okay? You have to double click, Nate, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So the focus of this technical assistance project, which was funded um, on, by the state under uh, because the town got a housing choice uh, designation, uh, the focus was on uh, exploring uh, smart growth uh, in Amherst uh, through a 40R smart growth overlay district zoning which is uh, meant to really promote mixed use development, multifamily development with the inclusion of uh, affordable housing requirements and design standards. Um, in addition to the 40R work, we were also asked to um, provide some input on other potential development opportunities or sites in the community that might be suitable for some amount of affordable housing. Um, the major tasks have been to kind of engage in a uh, significant community engagement process uh, to look at a number of options with respect to potential locations for a smart growth overlay district. Um, and to do research and analysis regarding to uh, zoning and uh, policies that have worked effectively in other places that might resonate with uh, the town of Amherst. And once again, importantly, design standards. Because the zoning is by right, design standards become very important uh, to protect community character. And then to prepare a draft bylaw. We have, uh, here tonight to, we'll get into it, to present at least the preliminary components of that uh, bylaw. Next um, slide. So with respect to what we hope to touch base on tonight, uh, we're gonna just um, talk a little bit about where 40R is currently uh, working. Um, look back a little bit to where we have been um, going uh, and we're um, to get to this point in the planning process tonight. 
um, we're going to talk about some of the issues that we've uh, we've heard throughout the planning process, and um, talk about you know how a town establishes a 40-hour district, and then get into the major components of the proposed. Uh, preliminary draft zoning. Um, also, uh, speaking a bit on uh, next uh, steps. Next slide. So this map shows uh, uh, in the shaded yellow areas where, uh, what communities have 40-hour uh, districts in place. And that totals to about 49 districts across 42 municipalities. Uh, with Azurite zoning for over 19,000 projected units um, and getting, you know, approaching 4,000 units that are uh, being built uh, or have been completed. You can see that uh, the bulk of the Poirier districts are, are in the eastern part of the state, but certainly there are a number of uh, Poirier districts in proximity to Amherst. Um, next slide. including East Hampton, uh, which passed a 40-R district to, with a projected 482 housing units, 50 of which have been completed and 18 units approved. And those 18 units are in a mixed-use development uh, where the developer put it two uh, properties together. Um, the uh, first floor is retail, there are some handicap accessible units in the rear and um, most of the residential units uh, above the first floor that include four affordable housing units. Next slide. Um, and Northampton um, actually has, uh, has uh, three at this point, uh, 40R districts, two in, uh, various two, two in separate phases of the Village Hill um, project that involved the redevelopment of the state hospital um, on 30 acres with the projected 429 units of which 149 have been approved. And with respect to a mix of housing, it includes single family housing, multifamily housing, home ownership, rental, has some special needs housing, um, some workforce housing is a, a true mix of housing types to address a range of housing needs. It also approved more recently a third 40R district that centers on only one building, um, which uh, is sponsored by the Valley CDC uh, for 31 units of enhanced SRO housing. The City decided instead of doing what they typically would do a 40B development, that they would use the 40R process. Um, mainly because A, they had a template already in place that they were comfortable with and they felt that they could uh, readily adapt this particular uh, project to the uh, 40R zoning um, template. They also had a working relationship with DHCB and had experienced pretty quick turnaround times uh, for approvals. And third, there are financial incentives that uh, come with 40R that would help make the project financially um, more feasible. Uh, next slide. So uh, this slide just points to some of the, you know, major milestones that we have uh, realized in this planning process so far. Um, first, we've conducted uh, outreach to um, housing stakeholders um, to almost 30 uh, interviews, uh, largely to get early input on um, key challenges and opportunities for uh, 40R or other affordable housing developments, getting guidance on what they thought were uh, appropriate locations for a 40R district, as well as potentially other properties that might be conducive to including some affordable housing uh, development. Uh, we held our first community meeting on April 4th, 
And we brought in representatives from various state entities, including uh, Mass Housing, um, which uh, provided funding for this project, uh, DHCD, which is the approval entity for this, uh, for any 40R district, um, the Citizens Housing and Planning Association, as well as the Massachusetts uh, Smart Growth Alliance. And we went through uh, local and state housing needs, uh, smart growth principles, uh, as well as uh, 40R more specifically, and this particular technical assistance project. Um, the, uh, we then moved on to a site analysis strategy uh, that relied uh, you know, heavily on what we heard from the first community meeting um, and through the interview uh, process where we were, uh, where we obtained a whole list of site selection criteria that would be critical in trying to locate um, a 40R district, um, as well as uh, input on um, what folks thought were uh, reasonable locations for a 40R district. Um, we held a second community meeting on June 4th to obtain additional input on priority uh, site selection criteria and best locations for 40R district. Um, all these community meetings had uh, a presentation and uh, break, small breakout groups. So there was real kind of engagement of participants uh, in discussions and feedback uh, towards the project. Um, I should add at the second community meeting, we based on our initial input, we came in uh, kind of focusing on three potential 40R districts, which included the downtown North Amherst and Pomeroy Village. Based on the input we got from this meeting, we added a fourth uh, location, which was East Amherst. Um, and then we went back and we looked at the, uh, what was being discussed and uh, in the four, uh, June 4th meeting and uh, realized there was a uh, large agreement that those four areas were would be good uh, smart growth uh, areas for 40R, but there didn't seem to be any consensus on which was the best area. Uh, so we went through a process of revisiting the site selection criteria, prioritizing uh, them, and then trying to uh, reflect on those by the locations, the four locations that uh, were identified. And based on that analysis, the downtown edged out the other three uh, areas, but it was clear that all four areas would be uh, suitable. And so we uh, decided to take the downtown on as the first location and given how uh, the town's experience with that, look to the other locations as uh, possibilities in the future. We then held a third community meeting on December 19th to go over this location selection process um, and obtain additional input on how we can make 40R uh, work best and introduced uh, design standards and got some feedback on design standards that are, uh, would be integrated into the actual zoning. Uh, from, from state uh, requirements and state guidance, as well as looking at uh, other uh, 40R zoning bylaws, and then reflecting on all the input that we've obtained through the course of the project, we drafted a uh, 40R bylaw. We took a stab at it and um, uh, we're going to present the key components of it tonight. Uh, we have planned on having a fourth community meeting to get input on the draft bylaw. And yes, Dave and I have been committed to doing that given COVID-19. It becomes a little dicier, but uh, stay tuned uh, to, um, to, to that. Um, and let me also mention that the presentations from the three community meetings 
um, are on the town's website. So people who are curious about kind of the focus of those meetings, uh, uh, please uh, go to the website. Next slide. Next slide, there we go. Well, you can imagine through the length and, uh, of this uh, project and all the meetings, and uh, we, we, we have heard quite a lot from folks on comments and issues that we need to, um, we really need to respond to um, in preparing this, uh, this zoning. Some of the themes that we have frequently heard um, are just listed below. Um, there was there was general agreement, if not consensus, that smart growth zoning makes sense uh, in Amherst, um, and it would be a useful tool a tool to uh, to explore. Um, another common or theme was the town should guide development to areas that are most appropriate for greater density and away from rural areas and environmentally sensitive sites, away from green fields and in areas uh, where uh, mixed uses and density are appropriate. And residents want a vital downtown with mixed uses. They also want to maintain the historic quirky character of the downtown too. Um, but uh, there is, I think, general support for the notion that the downtown needs more investment. Um, another perspective has been that the town lacks meaningful design standards and 40R provides the vehicle for really articulating uh, clear standards that resonate with the, uh, with the community and uh, the, the town's character. Um, very importantly, the integration of affordable housing is important and that's something uh, in the downtown that's not mandated in zoning. Um, the town does have inclusionary zoning in place, as you know, for special permit, uh, but uh, there was some, you know, chagrin about doing development in the downtown and doing new housing and not having an inclusion of affordability. Uh, I mean, it's, it's worth mentioning that we have heard that there should be some consideration for uh, coupling an adoption of a 40-hour uh, smart growth district with some down zoning uh, in the downtown um, in the BG district because uh, five-story uh, development in that district is allowed by right. Um, because of the concerns regarding the inclusion of affordable housing and design standards, it would be advantageous for the town to have developers apply the 40R permitting as opposed to um, the underlying zoning, um, which is allowed, um, and, and thus uh, getting, uh, preventing some of the problems that some perceive uh, cropped out as far as new development uh, in the downtown area. And um, parking, remains uh, a, a challenge. Next slide. Uh, this uh, flow chart just shows kind of the major steps that are needed uh, to establish a zoning, a 40-yard district. Um, I mean, it's basically a do -si do with the state um, and uh, with this locality not being able to move forward uh, with uh, with zoning, with, a, with the approval, without uh, preliminary approval from the state. And we have been ongoing discussions with the state and keeping them apprised of where we are in the uh, process and getting their input. Um, so uh, uh, that has been, I think, very helpful. Uh, next slide. So now we get to the major components of the bylaw. Uh, it is important to note that this bylaw, uh, based on 40R statute regulations, must be all inclusive and without reference to other zoning uh, in the, the town's bylaw. 
um, the first section of the bylaw states a purpose. And, um, and we have included language that basically states to foster a range of housing opportunities along with mixed use development components to be proposed in a distinctive and attractive site development program that promotes compact design, preservation of open space, and a variety of transportation options, including enhanced pedestrian access to nearby, to employment and nearby uh, services. We have, I mean, and uh, we have added that um, that the purpose is also be in accordance with the purposes of uh, the Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40R. Uh, under the purpose, it also lists uh, some objectives um, that range from diversifying housing tops for types for a variety of incomes and ages and household sizes um, and uh, establishing quality design standards in a fair and effective uh, development um, permitting and approval process. Uh, promoting sustainable and pedestrian, pedestrian develop, um, friendly development. And another objective relates, or a couple of objectives relates to uh, generating positive tax revenues and also additional financial uh, resources that come with 40R uh, zoning approval and uh, development. Uh, section two includes a list of definitions that are uh, in the bylaw. Uh, section three is establishment. Um, this section defines uh, the, the, the boundaries of the downtown Amherst Smart Road Overlay District and will uh, and references a zoning map that would be created. Um, section four on applicability. It you know, clarifies, reinforces that this uh, bylaw is all inclusive. Uh, it states that the developer also may uh, apply uh, the requirements of the underlying uh, zoning um, over the uh, zoning in the, in the uh, overlay district. Uh, section five is permitted uses. Um, with uh, residential proje projects, including multifamily, uh, mixed use development, um, also including multifamily development, includes uh, parking and other accessory units, uh, other uses such as commercial office, cultural, civic, institutional, or other non-residential uh, uses. Um, and then, Next page, next slide, uh, chapter six is on affordability requirements. Um, at, you know, at, at least 20% of the housing, unit, housing units must be affordable and eligible for inclusion in the subsidized housing inventory, um, but 25% in the case of rental developments. And that would allow, allow all units in that development to count towards the SHI. Uh, a basic requirement is that there has at least 20% of all units created in the uh, zoning district must be affordable. Um, section uh, seven, under plan approval, um, it uh, you know, stipulates the as of right permitting and approval process. It uh, designates the planning board as the plan approval authority um, and the the 40R regulations do allow um, the PAA to adopt um, administrative rules and regulations, but they have to be approved by DHCD. And then it goes into some plan approval procedures uh, with a pre-application -applic process, uh, a list of required materials as part of the application, um, states uh, that fees, uh, are allowed, but they have to be approved by DHCD um, as uh, reasonable. Um, allows for the circulation of the application to other boards for review and comment. Uh, and an, an important uh, public hearing is essential, and peer review is also allowed. 
uh, section nine, next page, um, and regarding plan approval decisions. And this is important. Plan disapproval is only allowed when an application is incomplete, does not meet zoning requirements, and it is not possible to adequately mitigate significant adverse project impacts on nearby properties by means of suitable conditions. Uh, waivers by the planning board can be allowed, but not affordability requirements. They cannot be waived. Um, and project phasing is allowed, but you know, once again, the affordability requirements are uh, an important part of that and has to be, uh, they have to be proportionate uh, to numbers of units included in each phase. Uh, section 10 deals with uh, any change to plans after approval, uh, allowing minor changes without the need for a public hearing, but any major ch uh, changes must be processed through a new application. Uh, section 11 goes on to design standards, and I'm going to pass the baton to David, who will uh, take up from here. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And just, just sort of 10 seconds of background, Karen and Abacus have been working together for what, a dozen years, um, cities and towns all over Massachusetts on affordable housing planning. And Karen's area of expertise is the process and procedures and policies. We're architects and planners. It's the design and the physical form. So. Uh, section 11 is design standards, which is about planning the physical form. So they're called design standards and they deal with a series of subjective issues. It deals with design, but these are required. So it's assumed that there's a certain amount of negotiation, but only to a limited extent. These are requirements that are meant to protect the best interests of, of the town. Um, and they're intended to reflect the kind of vision of the community. And there are a diverse set of opinions in Amherst like there are in most communities. But we're trying to distill out of everything we hear a kind of sense of where Amherst, Amherst could or should go to meet a broad range of issues. You know, want to maintain the small town character, but if it's completely unaffordable to the vast majority of people because there's enough housing, that tends to be a problem. Um, so what we're trying to do with the design standards is preserve the positive aspects of the existing town character. There are places and buildings that people really love. Improve the pedestrian experience. There are places where there are big swaths of asphalt and lots of cu curb cuts. Can we improve those areas with the, with the design standards? Um, make it good for business. If it improves the pedestrian experience, if you get people living downtown, that's probably going to be a really good thing for business. And we're in a challenging period right at the moment. Nobody knows what the future holds, but we're assuming that there will be a kind of rebound, that people will want to go to bars and restaurants and stores and do the things they've done. And we should at least plan for that, even if nobody really knows what the future holds. And a big component is affordable housing development. And I think that's one of the major things that triggered the whole 40R process and procedures at the state level. Um, so the goal with the standards begin by laying out goals um, for design. Um, and that's the context in which designers and developers do their planning and decision making. And they allow a certain amount of discretion on the part of architects and developers because you can't dictate good design. You can't tell everybody exactly what kind of windows go where, but you can set the parameters in which those, those plans are, are, are developed. Um, and the trade-off is this. You have far more rigorous standards than you have with normal zoning. But on the other hand, if developers and property owners meet those standards, it's as of right and it accelerates the process. And there's a kind of certainty there. That's the kind of public-private deal that's being made. So next, um, next slide. Um, then the state reviews the standards. So a city or town can set up 
onerous requirements and the state will say these are too onerous these will prohibit really just about any kind of development we can't allow this to pass as 40r but you know we don't want to get to that point we we, we want to send something to the state that really is pretty reasonable and is a win-win-win situation so the design standards are based on what's called form-based zoning and people on the planning board may or may not be familiar with that standard zoning is about crunching numbers and uses and if you meet those requirements you know you're good to go form-based zoning is about design it's about massing it's about proportions it's about materials it's about articulation and the challenge is to make those requirements really clear without trying to dictate to that that tends to be counterproductive and that's why this is a step in the process you know, we have what we think are a pretty solid set of design standards and, and um, bylaw, but we want input. And the sort of standard line is, we are experts on planning and design. You are experts on Amherst, and, and, and we want to work with you on that. So um, the, and I think the next slide, you'll see this in a map, the standards define three sub-districts. So we have a relatively large 40-yard district that we're proposing, but it's different on different sides. So, um, and I didn't make up these names. These are standard names based on form-based zoning, urban center, North Pleasant, East Pleasant, Triangle, the really the downtown areas of, of of Amherst downtown. General Urban is a budding West Cemetery, which is a little bit different. You know, it's not bounded by a street on the east side. It's not bounded by a street on the west side. It's removed from North Pleasant, but is seems to be an extension of the downtown area. And then suburban, not necessarily suburban, but suburban, facing North Prospect, Halleck, and, and Coles Lane. Um, you know, these, this abuts uh, residential neighborhood, and it can't be and shouldn't be the same des uh, design standards as on um, North Pleasant, as downtown. And the standards do provide basic dimensional requirements, heights, setbacks, um, along with site planning, facade, streetscape, and, 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 and other kinds of um, requirements. So go to the next slide. So there you see, and this is, it's a little blurrier than I would like, but you can see the outlines of the 40R district. You can see the kind of heavy hatching along North Pleasant, uh, Triangle, and East Pleasant. You can see there's a triangle on the east side, and that's the second sub-district, which is not the, 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 the urban center. And if you go... Um, you'll see this up on the north, um, north of Triangle Street, and then on the left hand, on the west hand side, abutting the residential districts. So these are, you know, they, they, this, the standards are significantly different for those areas. Um, and then next slide. So the next four slides are the kind of illustrations that will, will be part of this. So, you know, most standard zoning doesn't have illustrations. There'll be a series of illustrations. So there are lots of words in the design standards, but also pictures. You know, how do you avoid huge swaths of asphalt by making this kind of parking guidelines actually part of the requirements? Next. So building articulation, again, not part of standard zoning. Um, articulation on the first floor, which identifies this. And, and, and this would not be, this would be in you know, along North Pleasant. This would be different in the different sub-districts. But you can see the section, you can see the articulation at the top and at the bottom. This is very characteristic of the older buildings in your downtown and lots of downtowns. So this isn't meant to be a stylistic dictate but to accentuate the pedestrian zone and to give some profile along, uh, along the top. This is, tends to be what makes good downtowns. Next slide. Um, streetscape, 
this may or may not be part of it. The streets are already in place. To what extent do we want to require developers to develop what's outside of their property? Um, that's a question to this be included. Might there be new streets, um, especially um, towards the east between the first and the second sub-district? Might there be a new street if property owners get together, aggregate their properties, and instead of having big backyards and big parking lots, to do a new street? So, so that's one of the questions we have. Uh, next slide. And facade design guidelines. This is not to be, this is not meant as a picture of what the facade should look like, but it's meant to define some of the key elements we expect uh, developers, property owners, and their architects to provide. These are described in words, but here are pictures as well, and you can see there's some dimensions there. And there will be more illustrations and different illustrations with the different sub-districts, but the first thing we wanted to find out is, like, do these sub-districts make sense? You know, we want, if you think there are more substantial revisions, we want to hear about it, and then we'll fill in all the holes um, and, and tie things down. And then the final um, slide is a series of questions, and these are sort of Karen's questions, my questions. I can, um, I've got the mic, I can go through these. These are some of the areas where we want uh, input. Um, require all affordable units um, um, to retain affordability in perpetuity. So that's a, there are, you know, state requirements, but there are some, uh, you know, local decisions that can be made on this. Um, often there's a minimum project size to require uh, affordability, like 13 units and above. Might developers want to keep parcels small and stay under that so they don't have to provide affordable, affordable units? Do we, where do we want the threshold to be? Um, should there be accessibility and also potentially sustainability requirements beyond meeting building code? For example, city of, city of Boston for larger developments requires meeting um, lead gold standards. <clears throat> um, setbacks from the street. Is it appropriate to set minimum rear mail? Oh, I'm sorry, this is parking. Big, big, big question, and one we haven't really tackled because it really is a much bigger issue. Should there be minimum parking requirements? Let's say one space per unit or one space for 300 square feet of retail or office. Should there be a maximum requirement, which is unusual, but, but um, more towns like Cambridge has the maximum amount of parking. So a developer may say, hey, the market's telling me two spaces per unit, that's what I want to do. And Cambridge will say, nope, too many cars on the street. We don't want to do that. So we really want to input on that. Um, we're feeling like along um, North Pleasant, buildings should be a minimum of 15 feet away from the curb line, but a maximum of 20 feet. You know, if you want a retail district on a main street, you don't want buildings to be set back 35, or we don't believe buildings should be set 35 feet back behind a front yard. But again, we want to hear from people. Um, 40 hour street design requirements. I, I, I showed this slide of street design requirements. Should those be required? The three sub districts are people feeling like. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And these haven't been put out in public. We heard over and over and over, there should be sub-districts as different characters. Um, are these the right dividing lines in the right sub-districts? And single family homes, um, should those be allowed in the two denser developments? And we could probably come up with a lot more questions and you may have a yeah, lot of yeah. questions. Those, those yeah, are the yeah. questions we came up with. And then the final step, we, we want to resolve all of this work with the state on obtaining the go ahead for local, um, local adoption. And then Karen, I don't know if you want to add anything or whether we want to turn it over. Uh, can I just add something? Um, I mean, clearly there's going to be a whole process um, of digesting the draft between the planning board and another public meeting and um, to work towards even going to the state for um, 
uh, for the next next step. I wanted to point that out. Um, if, maybe I could add something more. We wanted your opinion, but uh, well, I can. I guess as these questions are raised, we can we can we can deal with them. And if, um, so, um, yeah. I guess we, I just say this is a twenty-eight page document, so yeah. there is a lot to digest. Okay. Thank you. Um, there, you're not kidding. There's a lot to unpack here. A lot of good information. Um, thank you so much. Um, that's a lot. I'm sure we're all a little like woo. Um, uh, if you're willing to take questions now, I was going to open it up to the board first. Um, so, hello out there. If uh, anyone has questions. I see Maria has a question. Um, yes, thank you for that. I went to, I think, all, all the public forums um, that you held and um, didn't manage to speak to any of you, but I really like a lot of the ideas proposed. And um, there is so much here. I'm going to try to stay big picture and not get into the weeds right away. Um, I guess maybe the big picture thing that for me is um, uh, the, the, the sort of demising line of how you create this overlay district. I looked really closely at it this afternoon and um, there are a lot of different owners of the parcels, but generally I liked your idea of just putting the parking in the back, creating a streetscape. And there was a little bit of conflicting information here and there about whether it was a zero street setback or a 15. And it sounds like you're heading more toward the 15. But um, I guess, yeah, I, I, it would have been nice to have a little more of a fine tooth comb in dividing the sub districts because um, there are some areas where it doesn't quite make sense like for example the post office is included and there's this church that owns a bigger parcel but we've divided it into two different sort of sub districts so I, I guess I'd like to know more about um, do you see this as a, a general map that um, maybe it's malleable as far as it's um, boundaries but that we we stick with like your idea of all right if you want to create a streetscape use these set of criteria if you want to create more of a transition area use these sets because right now i think the dividing of the blocks seem like they need a little more study but the idea behind like urban versus transition versus residential it it feels right as far as what you've proposed just sort of big picture question is, you know, did you study the parcels really closely or were you just sort of mapping like based on um, general circulation of cars versus pedestrian? This is how you came up with that sort of dotted black line that's the overlay boundary because um, there's some areas that still feel like it's a little too heavy handed as far as it's this, you know, and so I wonder if you can speak more about just the overall uh, you know, the boundary, that black dashed line that's in this sub-district map you're showing. There's a lot of negotiation. So if we did like a time lapse of the different versions of that, <laughs> you would see that black line wiggling around um, quite a bit. So we, 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 we work with a number of people. I mean, Karen and I, and, and Nate was very involved, and Chris was very, very involved, mm -hmm. are just, you know, intuitive sense of what made sense. And it's not like this is right and everything else is wrong. And again, this is why, where we want input. It was our best guess as mm -hmm. where we, we, you know, allow the opportunities that 40R brings with it, where mixed use development, bigger development, um, multifamily housing development kind of makes sense. I mean, were there particular areas, you know, with the yeah, like question? I guess, you know, along the along North Pleasant, um, where the post office is eliminated, and I think the, well, there was always plans for the fire station, but then with the church with the larger, more modern church piece behind it, and the, uh, well, I'm sorry, I'm jumping all over the place, but um, I guess the more southern portion that's closer to the existing, taller, historic downtown, um, that area looks like it's 
it's a uh, baby needs a little more study. I love what you did closer to the two new developments up toward Kendrick Park. I think that what you propose makes a lot of sense and the scale there makes a lot of sense. But I think that part that transitions between the existing historic downtown going north on um, North Pleasant, it, th there's a lot of pieces there that I'm not sure are movable or changeable and that maybe uh, maybe that that should be considered, you know, some of them need to just be considered as landmarks and then others, and then you work from that. Um, I think in your proposal, like from the massing, you did keep the church, and I think almost everything else is um, uh, eliminated other than the newer developments, which um, I, I think is fine. I think I just, um, yeah, I, I think that this little more finer tooth combing of like figuring out the area in the southern part but um but generally I mean the what you've sort of come up with toward the east side of Kendrick Park I think is really great um I, I hope that happens one day <laughs> um but uh as far as specific I mean there was like a like a 50 page uh document of your form-based code and um it took a while to go through. So I, I guess if there's future meetings, we could go into like specific line by line. I mean, unless you want that now, but um, I guess with the time we have, I was trying to stay more big picture kind of ideas. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't have a, like a specific block and I'm not sure you want the answers like that tonight, but um, yeah. No, that's a good question, Maria. Um, Dave and Karen, how would you be do you have any idea, because I assume you work with other towns and other planning boards, what would be the best way to get our comments, um, detailed comments? I mean, we can give you lots of general, but how does that usually work? Could I? Yeah, Karen, go um, ahead. I, I think it would be best to funnel them through Chris or Nate, and um, so they can see them and then they can channel them to us. Okay, that's good. Uh, Chris? But it would be good to have some detailed comments and if they could be in writing, that would be terrific. And that's what I was thinking. Uh, uh, yeah. Chris, would you prefer us to like, mark up the document? I think we sure. we got it as one giant PDF, but um, if there's a way we can get one that we can do markup or something and then submit our comments to you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Do we want to send it as a Word document? Sometimes it's tough yeah. getting 23 different Word versions back as markups. Um, um, sometimes it's better just to get a list. Here are the 14 items from different people, but I'm certainly open. I, I don't know. Um, you know, we every line matters. Every line of writing matters. Every line on that map matters. And as an architect and planner, we work under other people's zoning. So I know the importance of all of this. So we welcome whatever form the comments take. So I appreciate, I appreciate that. Oh, I don't know why we're going weird. How many mics do we have? Anyways, um, I appreciate that comment. So maybe at this point, uh, we should just do a bullet list, um, writing all of our comments to Chris. And then when we get to a finer version down the road, maybe that, you know, mm -hmm. we can just keep doing that and refine. But at least this first round, uh, we, Chris would get a feel of, because a lot of times, you know what happens. A lot of us are saying the exact same comments over and over again. Mm -hmm. And it could be comments that we really like a section too. So um, Maria, is there anything else? Or I'm gonna, uh, well, I am gonna move on to Doug, but first I'm gonna recognize Chris. But Maria, do you have anything else? Okay, you're good. So Chris, I'm gonna recognize you and then Doug, you're gonna be next. Okay, I was just gonna say, I agree that the bulleted list is the better um, way of communicating. I think that um, a markup is just really confusing when you have so many people uh, working on a document. And um, we did actually get some good comments from um, Rob Crowner. I don't know if any of you have seen them. It could be that the consultant just saw them, but he sent in a list of uh, comments and questions that he had, and then David responded to them. And, um, you know, there were all kinds of things like, did you really mean to say this on page five? So I think, you know, referring to 
particular pages and particular paragraphs, and if you can find a paragraph number to refer to, that would be helpful. Um, general comments would also be useful, but um, you know, we'll, we'll take them in whatever form, but I think that a bulleted list would be best. And Chris, when would you like uh, our comments back to you? Um, I think if you could get them back, you know, let's see, what week, what day is this? This is the 6th of May. Okay. Um, maybe by um, the 3rd of June. Um, we have a meeting scheduled for the 3rd of June, and that might be, that would give you a little bit less than a month. Would that be uh, reasonable? So, like, get them to you a couple of days before? A couple of days before that, yes. Yeah. Right. So, maybe the week, the Wednesday of the week before, which would be what? Um, maybe the 28th or 27th of May. Is that okay. Wednesday? So if that's clear with everyone, we'll go with uh, get your comments to Chris, a bullet item listing out. Uh, and it can be positives to things you really like, um, but your comments to Chris by the 27th of May. Okay, great. Um, Chris, anything else or I'm going to move to Doug? No, no, nothing else. Great. Uh, I recognize Doug. Um, I didn't, haven't been to any of the public meetings and I'm new to the planning board, so I'm uh, just figuring out this whole 40, 40 uh, our regimen. Um, but I did look at the presentation you made back in December. And so my first question was, uh, how did the audience react or feel about the massing that you presented? Uh, through the entire zone? Well, and one of the things, it's always dangerous doing that kind of massing because people sometimes think, oh, this is what they're proposing to build. And we're not proposing anything. This is an illustration of the kinds of things that could happen. It's also dangerous because the current zoning would allow most of that to take place. There were certainly... Um, there's some concerns about the size. I think one of the things that got said repeatedly was, well, you you know, um, I can imagine it being that big along um, North, North Prospect, you know, as long as it wasn't just a one five story building from bottom to top, I think people are reacting against what would, would um, um, what has been built. And a bunch of people said, you know, when you're getting closer to residential neighborhoods, we don't want these big blocky buildings. So, and that's in the design guidelines of sort of pushing down. So what was blocked out, some of that would not be allowable, even though we, you know, we did that modeling in the design standards as written because it scales it down um, towards the perimeter. Okay. And, and other people can weigh in. I mean, everybody filters what they what they hear, but there there were certainly concerns, and you know that's how they were addressed. And is it is it? Uh, are you getting a lot of feedback? No. Okay. Good. Um, so I was puzzled why uh, what I what I thought was a a regulatory regimen focused on residential. Why it seemed uh, in some of the locations in the text, it is also applicable to commercial office, cultural, civic, institutional, and non-residential uses. Why is that part of this and not dictated and left in our basic zoning? Um, I can respond to that. Um, the, the zoning has to be all inclusive. So what's ever in the 40R has to be included in the bylaw and the uh, 40R does promote mixed uses um, and housing in, in um, areas where there are multiple uses. Um, but they, the state didn't want to preclude other types of, uh, of uses and development in a district uh, as well. Uh, so it's, um, did I answer your question? Well, uh, not in a way that I understood. So, oh, uh, so 50% needs to be housing. 
but but it's right. in a like mixed use in a mixed use property at least um i think it's at least 51 percent has to be housing but there can be other developments within the district that don't include housing and so uh, those it, and so those developments would still be governed by our basic zoning code uh yeah, uh, well, we included uh, we included those uses in the bylaw. So I, okay. this is Nate, I, I can't raise my hand. Doug, I think one thing is if if someone decides to use a 40R, they can only use 40R. So if in the downtown, we said it was only for residential uses, the only, the only thing they could do would be apartment buildings. And so in a downtown, we'd want a mixed use building under 40R. So that's why you need to allow other uses. So in Northampton, in some communities, they have only a residential 40R, but it's in an area where they don't need or want commercial or non-residential uses. But in the downtown, if we want someone to use a 40R um, and we want it to be mixed use buildings, we have to allow that within the 40R. Otherwise, they can only do just the residential piece. So they can't they can't mix and match. They couldn't say, okay, well, I'm gonna do a little, part of my project will be under 40R and part will be under the underlying zoning. It's basically all 40R or nothing. Okay. But we are encouraging along North Pleasant that there be a commercial, be retail, be restaurants on the ground floor and housing up above. But instead of housing, it could be office up above partially but majority it has to be housing. So it, it seems appropriate um, to have mixed use, at least along North Pleasant and along Triangle. That's what makes it a downtown. Okay, and I guess my last uh, question is, um, is it correct that this really only works as a, a desirable framework for development if we substantially down zone the areas that are in place now. And that should have been on our list of questions. I, I regret, but even though, you know, Karen, you brought that up. Um, in our discussions a couple of days ago uh, with Chris and Nate and Karen and I, that was our sense. It would make it much more effective to do the down zoning. But, but there are still in the, um, in the 40R, kind of the preliminary boundaries, there's uh, uh, districts, the limited business districts, and the, uh, the 40R would, would apply, would likely be, there would be likely an incentive to use 40R instead of the underlying zoning. So that would be a boon to those areas. It's the, it's the general business area where we would like to uh, promote the use of 40R instead of the underlying zoning. Thank you. I um, recognize Michael. Yes, so, a process question. Uh, if we're going to submit uh, bulleted lists of comments on the, uh, on the pr presentation we just saw, I presume that's on the presentation as well as on the proposed zoning bylaw. Uh, if, if we are uh, going to get those, uh, I wonder if Chris could circulate to the planning board members the comments of the other planning board members. It's, I would think it would be very useful to get somebody's idea and spin off an idea off someone else's idea. So that if, it, as, as comments come in, Chris, whether you could send them out to us um, and thereby soliciting even more comments from those of us who had already made them. I don't know whether that's a violation of the open meeting law or not, but it would certainly be helpful if you could uh, uh, keep in communication with us on this issue as things come into you. Chris? Um, I might be able to generally characterize the types of comments I'm receiving, but I can't really send out specific comments um, because of the open meeting law. So. You know, if I start to get bulleted lists of comments in, I could send out a, a something that says, you know, people seem to be concerned about the height of buildings or people seem to be concerned about setbacks or something like that. But it, it would have to be very general. So I think what I'm imagining is you would send your 
comments to me by the 27th of May. And then we could have this as a topic of conversation on June 3rd. And then you could still have more time after that to submit more comments. This is not, there's no timeline here. We're not like trying to rush this through or, or anything. We really want people to be able to talk about it. We want your input. So, um, you know, I think if we, if we get the comments and we discuss them on June 3rd, then you can send in more comments and, um, you know, it'll be an ongoing process. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That's great. Um, I recognize Jack. Hello. Um, I just want to say, um, um, I, I'm wondering, um, I apologize, but I have, um, I have to, uh, I have to get up really early tomorrow morning. I was <laughs> at a very, very long day. So I'm just wondering, I'll hang in there for a little bit longer. And I apologize. Like, I, I want to understand this better. And if you could kind of condense this material, Chris, in, in an email that, you know, what we're supposed to specifically uh, review, because we've gotten a lot of emails lately. Yeah. Um, so, um, but again, I apologize for needing to check out, but mm -hmm. If, if we're if we're concluding soon then uh i'll hang in there a little bit longer that's all i had to say thanks thank you jack so at this point i'm not um seeing any other members with uh oh david did just raise his hand hold on and i only see one attendee right now um so uh, Chris, I think Jack had a good suggestion. If you can just send a summary, maybe just like what are our expectations and what your expectations are, what we're actually reviewing. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That would be great. Um, I'm going to recognize David and then I also see Janet and then I'll, um, go to, uh, attendees. Uh, if there are any other attendees out there, I see one hand, I think it's a Brian. Um, if there's anyone else put your hand in and we'll get to that. And then hopefully, um, we'll be sort of finishing up with that. Uh, cause we are over three hours right now. Um, and we'll move on to the rest of the meeting. So right now I recognize David. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. There's a lot of meat here. Um, and, and, and I'm looking forward to working through it. I just wanted to, and perhaps I don't, I just want to make sure I, I am understanding at least one part of it. And, and, and it seems as if the, in terms of the, the, the residential development, if a proposed project has fewer than 13 residential units, then the affordability issue doesn't come into play under the, the, um, the, the, the bylaw draft, as drafted. And Can I so, respond to that right now? Please. I am really glad that you brought that up because I did want to discuss that tonight. Um, you, you know, the state used, they, you know, they have some, some guidance and suggestions and they had a plug in figure at 13 and it didn't make sense to me. I thought it was too high. And, um, I, you know, looking at other uh, 40R bylaws, they don't specify a minimum project size. They just have that 20% and 25%. And given that the overall percentage of affordability in the district as a whole has to be at least 20%, 13 units does, just does not make sense. And so my strong uh, recommendation for your consideration would be just to eliminate any minimum project size in that particular section of the uh, bylaw. Food for thought. Thanks. Does that um, answer any more, David? Yeah. I think there was. Shoot, but it flew out. You know what, David? I'll call. Oh him. no! I, but yes, I have. I have it. So, so <laughs> could, could you could you um could you describe? I mean, some of the the financial incentives for that are available, utilizing the forty R versus. Um, you know the, the 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 absence of any using the 40b, but so uh, so that we can get a taste of some of that carrot as well. Um, I always yeah. find that the Thank the you. there are no financial incentives under 40b. The big incentive under 40b is density, 
and other waivers to zoning. Um, in 40R, there is uh, usually increased in density because there's certain, depending, depending on the type of housing, there are certain thresholds of density that have to be obtained uh, um, under the, um, through projects in the district. Um, but there are also what's called incentive payments. So based on the incremental increase in number of units projected in the district, the, um, the, there is a sliding scale on the amount of payments that the state will make to the community. Uh, there is also a $3,000 density bonus payment that comes with every uh, affordable unit that is permitted in the um, zoning district uh, through the 40R. So, um, you know, quite frankly, in districts that are that are designated for 40R that aren't very built up, there is obviously a bigger opportunity for these incentive payments as opposed to uh, districts that have uh, already um, um, kind of uh, are, are, are more built up where there's uh, there are fewer parcels that are undeveloped. Um, and uh, the, those are the main incentives. I should say, also add that communities that have 40 R districts um, are more competitive for a whole range of discretionary funding the state. Uh, an example are uh, Mass Works infrastructure uh, funds uh, where uh, a lot of communities that have 40R districts have also married uh, uh, their kind of uh, development with these extra uh, discretionary funds and uh, capital improvements. And that's another example. Uh, another uh, carrot is that if a, uh, and this is not as, actually this is not a big issue for, uh, for Amherst, but um, for towns that, um, uh, are still under the 10% uh, affordability threshold, uh, the uh, uh, state is actually denied some comprehensive permit projects um, that the towns have kind of fought against if the town was making a good faith effort with their 40R district. Uh, another example is uh, bonus points being more competitive for uh, state uh, funding for uh, school development. I mean, those are some examples of, uh, of some benefits from 4 ER. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to move and recognize Janet. Thank you. Um, there's parts of, there. There's I guess there are attractive things to this proposal and the 40 ER district. Um, I am pleased to see a recognition of the need for parking um, and having it in the rear. Um, I'm a little concerned about a broad waiver of that requirement since that seems to just lead us down a path. Um, I'm very much in favor of an increased affordable housing requirement. I've been pushing for a, a co comprehensive affordable housing requirement for all development in Amherst. Um, I like the idea of setbacks on the upper floors and the thoughtfulness to the pedestrian and shopper experience. Um, and I think it's a central issue in economic development, like what will draw people downtown. And I love the idea of clear and consistent zoning rules that apply to everyone and having attractive buildings. Um, people, developers can understand what they can build and residents can understand what can be built and not see all sorts of waivers and, and things. Um, but I still see a lot of possibility for, for waivers and a lot of language about waivers in this um, draft. So I, I do wanna say this because um, I think I was probably at the inception of this idea of a 40 yard downtown more than three years ago in a zoning subcommittee meeting. And I'm very concerned that the residents most affected by this proposal were not contacted and haven't been pulled into this process. This proposal of a 40 yard district downtown, mostly along um, North Pleasant Street, uh, I think initially across Kendrick Park, was made by a planning board member in a zoning subcommittee meeting as a thought experiment. And um, this thought experiment has gone on and through this process, has always, the downtown has always been listed as prime target for this proposal. There are three historic districts around the downtown. 
The downtown residents are extremely active. They proposed a residential properties bylaw. They meet monthly, um, very engaged people. They, they're really kind of protecting their neighborhood from you know, being kind of squished in between um, UMass and um, all the activities downtown. I know a lot of people there really support more development and more building downtown, but they really want to participate in what that looks like and the, and the size and scale of that. Um, a lot of people who attended the 40R public meetings weren't there because they knew about the meeting from advertising in the town, but because people personally contacted them. Like I was personally contacted and didn't hear about this meeting and I contacted people from the, that neighborhood in subsequent meetings. Um, if you attended a public meeting and you filled out an attendance form, you were never notified about the next meeting. Um, there was no information about the 40R proposal. Um, it was on the planning department website or the planning board website. It's been sort of hidden away on the housing trust fund. Um, so, and even the planning board hasn't been part of this process. It's, it's, I'm almost astonished that we've come to this point and this very large proposal for re overzoning, a huge change in zoning in downtown is only, we're only meeting now because of asking for it last January. Um, um, Doug, you asked questions about how people reacted to this proposal in December 19th. I think people were really taken aback. A lot of people were upset and stunned at the size of the buildings and they've actually gotten the, the, the buildings that are being proposed are actually have gone from four stories to five stories in the BL. Um, a lot of people were talking about a, not having a canyon of buildings on both sides of um, East Pleasant, North Pleasant Street. Um, people talked about, you know, preserving New England's, you know, Amherst's New England village look, its funky look. Harvard Square has a similar look. It has a mix of tall buildings and small buildings. I don't really understand why one corner of Amherst was picked as, you know, the look for the rest of the downtown. Um, so I have a lot of questions about, you know, why this district was built picked the scale, the lack of involvement of the people who will be most impacted by it. And I, so I hope this is really the beginning of a discussion with the planning board and the neighbors, neighborhoods around the downtown. You know, maybe it's a good idea, for the R is, is a great idea, but maybe it's a good idea to start smaller, like using one, you know, like Northampton or in a different part of town where it's not so consequential or so big to just basically say, we're gonna go from three floors of zoning to five stories, you know, in this scale. So I'm just, and I have a lot of very specific questions about, you know, different parts of this, but I know it's late and I just, I'd hate to have us all say, well, this is the proposal and let's just go forward. And this is the site and let's, let's go forward. And we haven't even talked to the people who are most involved, affected by it. So I could say more, but I, I, that's the gist of what I'd like to say tonight. Christine, we have two attendees. Can I just add something here? Um, and I appreciate uh, Janet's comments. You know, it wasn't until, it was well into the process when we even landed on the downtown. Um, and that landing came from a lot of input. So, you know, we really try to go through a, a deliberate process of trying to uh, identify uh, the best place to start with the 40R uh, district with lots of input um, from various folks. Now, you know, we're still, we're still not, the, the, the process of getting public input uh, has a ways, a long ways to go here. I mean, we're planning uh, the uh, four, uh, you know, hoping to have a fourth uh, public hearing where we'll talk specifically about the draft uh, bylaw and uh, and really encourage uh, uh, those in the neighbors to attend. There are also, if the planning board decides to move forward, there will be required hearings where um, we provide another opportunity uh, to for input. And um, you know, we certainly look for um, you know more instead of less um, uh, feedback. Um, in the community. And just to add to that, I mean, you raised some really good questions. 
And so a lot of your questions are process questions. Why didn't you? Why can't you? Uh, those are reasonable. And any ones that can make it their way into notes about specific things, you know, whether it's the outline, like you think that that's a particular a problem to include this property or questions about, I mean, five stories, you know, to circle that and say, is this appropriate everywhere? It, you know, those are good comments. Those would be from you. And then it could become part of a larger process. So, um, Appreciate more input on, on all of these issues from you. She didn't muted. Christine, you're muted. Thank you. Um, uh, Chris Bestrup, I see your hand up. Yeah, am I muted? No, I'm not. Okay, no, no, so no. I, I was muted. I had a printer going in the back, and thank you for reminding me. I wanted to acknowledge that we received an email from Morianne Adams um, today, and she is um, a neighbor. She lives on Beston Street, I believe. So she's very interested in what happens in the downtown and also in what happens to neighborhoods west of. Um, west of the downtown. She had asked me to read her questions, but I think you have all received her questions and can consider them carefully. And I think Karen and David received her questions today too. So the next time we gather to um, talk about this topic, um, you know, maybe you'll have had a chance to consider some of her questions. I think it's very late in the evening and I don't really feel that I want to um, read all of those questions right now. But I wanted to acknowledge that we have received this very uh, detailed and concerned um, email. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we'll all take a look at that. I did see the email come in uh, this afternoon. Um, I see Janet's hand, and then I'm going to move to the attendees. There's three hands raised there. Um, Janet, you had a follow up? Yeah, I just, you know, I have a bunch of comments, but one of just, just three big ones is. I don't think the proposal addresses or deals with the concerns about student rentals and filling the downtown with students. And so um, there are ways to restrict undergraduates from moving in wholesale into um, apartment buildings. And um, that's the worst nightmare is building a lot of housing downtown and having it turn, Amherst turn into like a student, downtown primarily students and what the impact that would have economically it also, I don't see how it helps that middle income residents can live here. I can see people, I could see apartments at the high end. I could see apartments that are affordable and I don't see how people with middle incomes will be able to afford to live downtown. And are, are there ways to put that into the um, 40R? I know Concord has done stuff with having people, you know, what they consider affordable or people with kind of higher incomes. I also feel like there's no protection of the downtown historic resources and community character. Um, and then there's no real encouragement of remediation and reuse of existing buildings. Is there a way to protect facades, the cottages, the quirky storefronts when you're expanding, but you keep the, the, the building? Um, you know, a lot of what people like about Amherst and shopping in downtown is in the BL um, along North Pleasant Street and um, those, those, you know, putting up a four, five-story buildings isn't going to help save that cottage Victorian look, that different things. And so, is there a way to put something in the 40R that, in, you know, protects those resources? The historic buildings aren't just the churches, on hall and the library. So that's that's all. Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna. Um move to the attendees and with Pam's help. Mm -hmm. Pam, if I saw yeah. Brian was the first hand that mm -hmm. went earlier, if we can go with that. Um, so it is getting very late. I just want to tell them we really do want to hear your comments and your questions, but if you could try to keep it, you know, as brief and concise, we would appreciate that. And um, that will give more time for the consultants to possibly give a better answer. Uh, Brian, could you please state your full name and uh, where you live? Yes, uh, Brian Thompson, uh, 6 Salem Place. 
Welcome. Um, Janet actually did a pretty good job. Uh, I should say I'm very used to apologizing for people for being between them and lunch. I'm not as used to apologizing for people for being between them and bed. So this is a first time for me. Um, but uh, Janet did a good job of really summarizing my question. I would just, and it re, um, really touches on workforce housing, or you might say middle class housing. I think it's how Janet put it. Um, Amherst is it's a uh, it's a destination. People people want to live here, and so if you build housing that is, you know, just the square footage looks like something a middle class family would be able to afford, or you try to do it along those lines. Um, you know, it's still going to go at a premium. So I don't, I don't think that just putting in mixed use is going to all of a sudden allow uh, kind of workforce housing to be developed. I think you have to have different policies and different strategies to do that. And that, that's my comment. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move to Robert. Uh, Pam, if you can enable that, and Robert, if you can give your full name and where you are from. Okay. The, this is really Dorothy Pam using your husband's computer because mine wasn't working. Um, can you hear me? We can. Welcome. Good. Fabulous. Okay. 229 Amity Street. So I went to uh, one of the early hearings and um, looked at all the kinds of houses that the um, uh, they were showing us, and the only ones that I liked that would, would have looked nice in Amherst were the ones we can't have, which is like uh, like East Hampton can have, uh, making over old buildings, so uh, old factory buildings. Um, but um, it was all kind of general. And then the next one I attended, uh, it was clear you were talking about downtown Amherst, and um, I remember that in the breakout groups, there was tremendous consternation. I, I could see it all over the room. We had four breakout groups. People were saying, what, you mean that here? And it was not a smooth um, event. So I, I guess everyone was told, well, it's just planning. It's not really here. So um, I can see how this could work out, but I'm not sure that it would work out. For example, um, waivers are allowed, so people would say, well, I'm going to, you know, waive the parking and um, we're going to have the same problem that we don't have enough parking downtown. But I'm going to focus myself really on what do you mean in subdivision three? Those are the areas that are really impinging on uh, the residential area, which I represent. That's the west side of Kendrick Park. I see the stripes there uh, above Coles. I see them going right into North Prospect, North Prospect Street, which looks like it'll be just a little cut off strip of houses next to, I don't know what, but, um, and then I see it go down further. So I'm really curious to know what the third subdivision would be. Thank you. Um, and uh, I don't know if anyone wants to answer. Okay, so uh, Hilda. I believe you can speak, introduce yourself. Or did she? Oh, put her hand she down? can't. Okay. Well she, done. she did have her hand up. It's down. Oh, yeah. No, it's still up. Go ahead. Uh, Hilda? Can she allow to talk? Okay, there we go. I think she's. Now I got it. Okay. Yep. Um, basically, I was going to try to shut up, but you know me. Um, You're doing it. So state your name and your address. Oh, Hilda again. Greenbaum, 298 Montague Road. Thank you. And I have been to most of the hearings. I have read all of the literature. And at the meeting, I want to say that Janet and Dottie have very much put their finger on all of my issues. Um, the interviewee list really shocked me because it was so biased. Left out most of the people who know what's going on downtown. And uh, in any event, I, I just want to say that I want to refute what the develop, what the consultant said about picking the downtown because I sat at that meeting around one of the tables 
we're the former chairman of the planning board, we're members of the Chamber of Commerce, we're one of the big developers in that neighborhood. Nobody at that table wanted it downtown, nobody. And that seemed to be the impression that I got from, um, from reading also the interview letters, that the downtown was sort of, you know, not really on the radar. And it looked like Beacon wanted to have it really badly up here in North Amherst, which wouldn't have thrilled me either, but I think it, it would have been a better idea if you really wanted to develop some housing. Um, one of the things that concerned me a lot by listening to the chamber and the bid discussion Monday night, and again, that it shows up in, in, in the um, bylaw that you guys have written, is getting rid of the design review board. And if you're getting rid of the whole zoning bylaw by a developer accepting the 40R in its place, then it looks like the historic local historic district commission and the regulations for the historic district also go down the drain. I'm very concerned about that. Um, one of the other things that bothered me is the fact mixed use building and have zero to 49% commercial. Well, that brings up a whole can of worms too. And I wanted to say the reason we got the design review board working very hard in town meeting was because of Amherst Savings Bank excrescence right at the center of town. Tore down nice little brick strip buildings to put up that ugly bank, which was stuck with in perpetuity. So that's why we have a design review board, even though they're not taken very seriously. Um, okay, so getting back to the whole commercial aspect, since the new buildings were built downtown, I have very little reason to go downtown because it seems to me, my kids counted it, there are 21 Chinese restaurants, there are bars, now we've got economic development and marijuana. The only thing I decided I go down for is my bagel fix. Or I go down and get my hair done when you can, but that's off the, and the, that and the cinema are off. But I mean, basically, in the olden days, we had Matthew Shoes, we had Ann August, we had Walsh's. There was a reason to go downtown and go shopping. There doesn't seem to be a reason anymore. And if we're going to fill up the downtown with residential, there seems to be, what are we going to get? More Chinese restaurant, more pizza, more bars, more marijuana. So I think that this has to look, be looked at more carefully, encourage more commercial. Um, I know that the square footage is going to be very expensive for commercial in new buildings because of the stretch code and the building codes, et cetera, et cetera. But when we got one East Pleasant Street, we lost to carriage shops. And I used to frequent Creative Needle. I used to frequent the, the uh, the music store to buy violin strings and music for my kids. And the dust, you know, we've lost all this. And I don't see it coming back unless somebody makes a real effort to uncover something other than restaurants, bars, and marijuana for economic development. So now I've said my piece. Thank you. I'm going to uh, go move to Rob Crowner. Uh, Pam, can we enable him? Uh, Introduce yourself and state your address. Rob Crowder, 44 Spalding Street. Welcome back. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about this proposal. Um, it's, it's something that uh, I've been looking forward to for a long time, uh, rezoning downtown and not, not focusing just on um, the, the general business parts, but, but the outlying parts, including the limited business parts and, and even some general residence parts. Um, I think it's important. Um, the downtown hasn't really, you know, it hasn't worked like it, like it could um, because it's, it's too constricted. So spreading it out a little bit makes a lot of sense. I like how um, the, Proposal makes several zones and it steps it steps the uh, density back towards uh, the residential areas. Um, I think the 
the where the lines are drawn for the subdistricts seem right to me. I'm not really sure what Maria was getting at. Um, I think they look right to me. Um, and I think I think they're also important because there's an opportunity to um, to develop across subdistricts where you have uh, um, a larger building that that actually becomes smaller towards the back. Um, and so it's important to have these subdistricts. Um, I also want to point to um, in speci specifically the RG zones on the west side of, of North Pleasant Street um, that Ms. Pam was talking about. R right now, the, the, the middle part there, um, not, not the one a little farther down, the middle part. Yeah, that one, there's, there's already an apartment complex there. Um, so it, zoning doesn't mean that something's going to happen. It just provides an opportunity for, for something to happen. And if that, if that um, apartment complex were to be redeveloped, I think it would be great if it were redeveloped under 40R. Um, and and, the, and, the, and the, the, uh, the last, the bottom of RG zone where the, where the church house is and the parking lots are, that's an RG zone. You can't do anything there except build uh, um, some residential um, uses, but it's part of the downtown and it should be available to use um, for downtown type development. That, uh, if, you re if you were to rezone that according to the, to, to the bylaw that's been proposed, you will create an opportunity to actually build a parking garage there. And a parking garage doesn't, I don't assume it will not be built by the town for a long time, but a private developer could build a parking lot there under this zoning, it can't be done now. That's an important piece of, of this uh, proposal, I believe. So um, I don't have more to say as we go along, but, those, but I'm, I'm excited about this proposal. I think it's, I think it's, it's um, uh, has a lot of the things that I've been looking for for many years and I hope, I hope you'll support it. Christine, you're on mute. Yes. Sorry, I was cleaning up there. Uh, can you, uh, I recognize Janet Keller, and can you uh, unmute her? Yes. Janet Keller, I believe you can speak uh, your name and address and um, your comment, please. Thank you. Um, Janet Keller, I live um, at 120 Pulpit Hill Road up in North Amherst. And um, I would like to ask um, that um, you, uh, in, an attempt be made to reach out to those who attended previous meetings, particularly um, the December um, 19 meeting. Um, I was very surprised to hear um, that among those present, um, many of whom I know are enthusiastic about downtown development, nonetheless expressed um, serious concerns. And um, I'm not hearing them tonight. And so um, you can see who's out there and I can't, but um, I'd really like um, to request that you provide an opportunity for them to um, uh, uh, to an another opportunity for them to comment before this gets um, too locked up. Um, I would also like to um, uh, put in a, a plea for um, greater attention to um, the historic resources, preservation of character, and adaptive um, reuse and maybe preservation of some facades, even if the building behind them um, is uh, going to be larger. Um, and finally, I would like to ask uh, Chris, um, I 
understand that um, I, I haven't seen um, uh, Maureen Adams' email, but um, it does seem kind of a shame that she took the, the opportunity to comment, um, and I'm sure that was pretty taxing for her. And um, I wonder if you could share with us maybe her top three concerns. Thank you. Oops. Um, thank you. Uh, and I think, I, oh, no, uh, Ken Rosenthal, can we allow him to talk? Thank you. Uh, Janet almost said what I was going to say about Morianne's uh, questions. This is a recording that's going to be made available to the public. You've been very kind to let all of us have our say. Morianne wanted to be heard, and that was how she was going to reach out to you and the public and the consultants. So is there some way that if you cannot read all those questions or comments, you could make them available to the public um, rather than summarize them yourself? I think she needs, her voice needs to be heard and her questions need to be heard just as she presented them. Thank you. Um, thanks. So, uh, uh, Chris, are you there? Yeah. I'm happy to read Marianne's questions. Um, she has four pages of questions, but it's rather large type, so I can read them, but I don't think that there will be an opportunity to answer them all. Would you give me permission to read them? Is that four pages? Yeah, as I said, the type is pretty big. It's probably 14 or 16 point. How many questions? Um, seven questions. All of the planning board members have this document and we could read them uh, on June 3rd, but if people feel very interested in hearing them, I would be happy to read them now. Um, there's, I see some hands from members. If, if Janet and David could turn um, off their hands for a minute and I'll just add, ask the board, um, raise your hand if you would like them to be read tonight or should we read them and address them at the next meeting that this is um, going to happen on June 3rd. Um, so right now the hands are down. So if, if anyone wants, feel strong, I just want to see if we can at least get a simple um, quorum. And I just want to remind everybody, we're three hours and 45 minutes into the meeting. Um, I only see one member raising their hand. So um, Chris, at this point, I, you know, I, it's, that's a long, if it was one or two pages, maybe, um, and I, yeah, um, I'm checking hands again. Yeah. All right. I, I, one more hand went up, but is there any way, hmm. I mean, Chris, you've read through them. Are there, are these different questions than what we've heard or? Won't, won't, won't these the the emails that are sent in are made a part of the public record so they're 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 readable by any by the public are they not um yeah well we all got them so it's part well chris how is this going to ha happen right now so it wasn't part of our packet but it did get emailed to us yeah you know what it seems like we're spending a lot of time talking about them so why don't i just read them quickly okay right? uh, i need to go <laughs> this is a four hour meeting. It's really, yeah, I, I it's, think it's, it's Chris, can we, can you post them tomorrow sure. somewhere? Yeah. And, post them, yeah. and I, I'll say to, you know, Miss Adams and, and everyone else that, you know, now I, I see this is really important. I saw it came in today. I will read it tonight. I'm sure we will all read it and we will think about it. And these, all of her issues will be considered and we will continue this dialogue and more um, feedback from people. Like what I kept hearing there is people really want to be assured that um, uh, people are contacted about this meeting, that they know it's there, that they can watch, that, and all this is going to be put on the web so people can read. I mean, I, we're such at the beginning of this right now. Like, we're not voting on anything. Like, we're just learning about it. I know I'm learning a lot about 40R. I didn't know. So, Chris, if there's a place you can post them, where would that go? On the planning board or the 
We would put them on uh, the place where the rest of the material about this 40 yard district is. I think Nate said earlier that it's posted on the um, Housing Trust website, but there's also a link to it from the planning okay. board or the planning department. Nate, if Nate is still here, maybe he can answer that. Um, yeah, I don't know. Nate, are you there? So anyway, and there is, think, um, yeah. yeah, we could, you know, we could try to uh, get documents up in, um, you know, I thought there was a web page under the planning, uh, planning department and, um, you know, we can try to link to it for, from a few way, different ways, just so people can find it easily. And maybe we could put it in the news again, um, so that it becomes just a, you know, a, um, you know, it's one of those items on the front just for, for a bit. So, uh, yeah, I think there's, you know, we can look at how to organize that material in a way that it's, it's you know, people can find it. Can you put, like, yeah, have a comment section? Because we got other people's comments, too. I don't want to put somebody's more head than others. We got a lot of comments, and we can't talk about them all. You no, know? no, agreed. Yeah, I think we could, um, you know, we already have the other presentations. But we could put all the other, all the presentations and all the comments received so people can just click and download a PDF of comments. Could that happen, you think, in, within the next week or something? Those? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That would be great. We really appreciate it. And, you know, we want to keep the information and transparency out there. Okay. So um, I, th I think we need to end this for uh, tonight. Um, and I, I want to, first off, I want to thank the consultants for coming. This is a lot of information for a lot of people. It's, you know, we're learning new things and there's a lot to digest. And, um, Thank you for all your hard work. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm just checking hands here. So at this point, Chris, um, we're thinking it will come back June 3rd and you'll receive comments from us on the 27th. Mm -hmm. And yes, in right. our comments, we can also comment on comments that we've read, you know, that um, from other people and affirm them or stress yes. them. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so if it's all right with everyone, we're gonna um, move ahead to uh, old business item five. Is there anything under that, Chris? I don't think so, nope. Okay. Uh, unless you, you had asked me to report on the CRC meeting, but um, I don't know if you want me to do that. Is that old business? Um, the, I could just quickly say the CRC, yeah. their meeting on the 5th, discussed um, zoning bylaw revisions and the process by which we would do zoning bylaw revisions and who might be involved in various bodies that might be formed or existing bodies that might um, do that work. And I could probably write up some notes and uh, circulate them. I assume CRC will be doing minutes from that their meeting, right? Could you yes. send it out to us when their sure. minutes come out? Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, and there was nothing firm that came out of them. It, the CRC, because I was there and um, I think Janet was there, we watched it and it was, um, you know, it's just a lot of discussion right now. They've got a lot of things they're thinking about, but there was nothing firm that was coming to us yet. But when they have something firm, they'll be sending us information. Um, thanks, Chris. So uh, item six, new business? No new business. Okay. Item seven, form A, ANR subdivision applications? No ANRs. Um, eight is upcoming ZBA applications? Um, Pam might have some, but the only one I can think of right now is the um, Colonial Village Playground. I think I might have told you about that last week. Um, they received, they are going to receive some used equipment from North Village and install it um, in the backyards of some of those buildings at North Village, I mean at Colonial Village, and they're going through the ZBA to uh, have that approved. Oh, I don't know if we had heard about that, but okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. No. Um, uh, number nine, upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications. These are some I might have also talked to you about. Um, we are on the verge of receiving uh, an application, site plan review application from Amherst Media um, to build a new building on Main Street uh, at the corner of Main and Gray. Um, that should be coming in. I have part of the application, but I don't have the drawings. 
um, we received an application from Russ Wilson to build a three season porch on a house um, at 11 Vista Terrace, which is the Applebrook, Applebrook Club Cluster Subdivision. And All About Learning wants to expand its playground. I think I might have told you about those last two um, the other day, last week. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, so we'll move on to um, item 10, report of the chair. Um, I have none. Um, number 11, report of staff. Thank you very much for um, attending the meeting in this unusual way and for sticking with us for the last several hours. Um, we appreciate it and thank you to the consultants. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, everyone. So if there's a motion to adjourn the meeting, if someone wants to raise their hand and someone else raise it to second it. <laughs> Hello, anyone awake? Raise some hands. Do you want to go home? Are you, oh, you are home. <laughs> Doug uh, and Michael, great. So I saw Doug's first, adjournment, Michael's second. All right, I think we're all in favor. Thank you, everyone. Um, you know, we're still making our way through this, this new Zoom world here, but I think we're doing a great job. Um, I'll see you all in a couple of weeks. Take Thank care you. of yourselves. Stay well. Christine and Christine and Pam and Nate and all everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Good night. Good night.